Ladies and gentlemen, if we can get started, if, um, Madam Clerk, can you do roll call, please? We'd like to call to order our, our budget workshop meetings uh, for June 15, 2022. I'm sorry, roll call. Commissioner Drosty. Here. Commissioner Parnez. Commissioner Preston. Here. Vice Mayor Hudak. And Mayor Gantz. Here. Uh, I know uh, Commissioner Parnes has a um, excused absence for this uh, meeting. He may try to join us via Zoom. Um, if we'd all please have a mo stand for a moment of silence and our Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If we could have approval of the agenda for June 15, 2022. Motion to approve. Motion from uh, Commissioner Drosky, seconded by Vice Mayor Hudak. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay. For participants watching the meeting via Zoom video, simply hover your mouse at the bottom of the screen, click the participants tab. On the right, you'll click raise hand. You'll be recognized by your profile name. And for those attending via phone or a landline device, simply dial star nine and you'll be recognized by the last three digits of your phone number. You may also have to dial star six if necessary to unmute. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor, City Commission. Uh, thank you for being here tonight for our budget workshops that will take place uh, tonight and tomorrow night. These budget workshops, um, the purpose of them is for uh, myself and staff to provide you with the department level recommendations um, and um, budgetary numbers that are, uh, obviously it's not a budget presentation of a, of a completed final uh, budget. Um, so we will be going through uh, a series of uh, steps today uh, talk about the budget message and the process, give you a little bit of background on the economic indicators and demographics, um, look at the budget consideration revenue forecasts, and then we're going to do something a little bit differently that we haven't done before, and this is something that uh, myself and Stephanie have been working towards, um, we're getting there, we're getting a lot closer, which is a uh, to make sure that the capital improvement program is highlighted a little bit differently than it has been in the past. In many years in the past, we've, we've talked about the CIP uh, program, but not in, in the, at the, de the depth that I think we need to, um, so that we can understand the near-term and the long-term um, expenditures that are associated with the capital improvement plan and how we intend to fund them. So we're gonna present that differently this year, and a big reason why we're able to do that and we're able to move forward with a lot of these capital projects is the city commission's uh, passage of the FY22 budget, which included for the first time ever a dedicated capital fund. So um, that's been very helpful in getting some, uh, some transparency into the process and uh, a funding mechanism for that. I also would like to take this opportunity at this point to um, thank staff, uh, particularly as it relates to uh, the budget presentation and, and the graphics, our public affairs and marketing department did a fantastic job with that this year and all the hard work and dedication that the department directors have done up to this point. <clears throat> this year's budget message is driving boldly. And there's a few things that I think we need to think about when we talk about driving boldly. The first and foremost is maintaining fiscal stewardship. Um, that has been a theme, I think, for this city commission for the uh, many years now. Um, and you continue to do that. Um, so. I think it really has paid off. When you think about what um, dollars we have put towards the budget in FY22, 
with the concept of renewing, recovering. Um, we have really injected a lot of capital deferred maintenance, and we're starting to see the fruits of that expenditure uh, come into play. And um, I, I think that we can continue to invest in our city through the capital improvement plan, as well as in maintenance programs that we have implemented and continue to implement, and we have enhanced in this fiscal year 23 budget. We also need to consider you know, the plan for our future in the long term as it relates to um, our utility infrastructure, our stormwater infrastructure, our, um, our economic outlook. And so we need to also anticipate this year an economic downturn. It's not that we see that happening yet. They haven't necessarily called it a recession, but you can see the indications of a recession. And that would be extremely high inflation uh, the Fed just did the uh, one of the largest um, interest rate hikes today, as a matter of fact, I think three quarters of a point. Um, the housing market is uh, higher than we've seen it in a very, very long time, and we'll show you those numbers here through this presentation. So unfortunately, I think the overall message for this budget I, is I think that a lot of any gains that we see in revenues are going to be absorbed by inflationary costs. In particular, when we talk tomorrow, um, and you take a look at the revenues coming in from uh, from our ad valorem taxes, most of that is going to be absorbed by our, our public safety expenses through the two contracts of the Broward Sheriff's Office, both for fire rescue and police. So we're gonna have to be creative and we're gonna have to think about those things as we move forward. Um, this is the budget process. It's, it's a yearly process. You see this slide every year for those who, who may be uh, in the audience or in Zoom, this is just uh, just to show that this doesn't this isn't an exercise from June to to October. We are working on the budget all year long. These are the critical dates for the uh, for the budget uh, moving forward today and tomorrow for the budget workshops. On July first, um, we'll have uh, ad valorem taxing authorities and special assessment districts and Department of Revenue. Um, they submit those certificates of value. So the numbers that we have today, just keep in mind that they are preliminary and we do get refined numbers from the state and the county in the beginning of, of July. We expect that we'll be a little bit more timely than we were last year uh, due to COVID. A lot of the state revenue estimates came very, very late. In Jul on July 12th um, at the city commission meeting, uh, the city will adopt the preliminary fire rescue assessment rate and the nuisance assessment rate resolution. And um, to be just to make the city aware that in this current year, the, the city approved a, another uh, fee assessment rate study. We've received those results and it is uh, recommending uh, a rate increase. And we will be meeting with uh, you individually in the coming weeks to have further discussions about the fire assessment rate at the July 12th meeting. On August 9th, uh, we will do the uh, budget workshop for the proposed budget, and just like we did last year. So again, this is the opportunity for the departments and myself to discuss the budget request with you, get your feedback, understand your priorities, gather that information, and then put the budget together to present to you uh, in a presentation the, the proposed budget in its final form. The budget must be submitted to you by August 15th. We'll have our first public hearing on September 6th and our second public hearing on September 14th. I'll just continue on. If, okay. In, in terms of demographics, I just think this is good information to get an understanding of, 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 of the city, its layout, and perhaps some uh, demographic information that may play into uh, our tax base and our tax revenues. So the unemployment rate in Deerfield Beach is 2.5%, which is pretty good. Um, I think it's an interesting number only because we hear so much about how hard it is to get uh, people to just the, the job market out there today. So just keep in mind that the unemployment rate is a represent, representation of those who are seeking employment and not necessarily all those who are not unemployed. The median household income for the city of Deerfield Beach is 47, roughly 47,000, and the county average is almost 61,000. 
our poverty rate is higher than the state average and the county average at 17%. And our population of those over 65 is higher than, um, higher than the state and the county as well. The labor force, which is an indication of those in the city who are actually uh, in, currently employed is 61.7%. And our persons per household is lower than the state and the county as well, which I think is also a, a reflection and, and coincides with that over 65 population. Our poverty rate, as I said, is uh, higher than, than the, um, the state and the county as well. And we turn to some economic indicators uh, that we currently have. And as you know, we've discussed, it's the CPI, it's, it's the consumer price index and, and the rate of inflation that we've seen. Uh, thankfully, this is the, the first uh, month where we've actually seen it uh, tail off. Uh, so hopefully we're getting to start to see some things get into control as it relates to inflation. Um, many of the line items and department budget requests that you see where we're talking about increases are due to these, as I mentioned, particularly as it relates to fuel costs, chemicals, steel, and those sorts of things. This was something that we looked at last year because we thought it was very interesting as it related to the consumer sentiment during the, the pandemic. And you can see how quickly it went down to a very, very low amount but what's even more interesting, I think, is that today it's lower than it was at the um, at the start of the pandemic. So the th that's another indication of you know an economy in a downturn. Want to just show the uh, unemployment rate here as um, as we've seen it over the course of a year. So you can see how it's continually gone down. Uh, this slide right here comes from the Broward County property appraiser, and it is a reflection of home sales within Broward County. Once again, we are in the top five, and once again, the majority of those home sales are made up of condos. Um, so, you know, the, the value of that tax revenue isn't as lucrative as if we had single family home values. Talking about uh, home values, the average assessed value for the city of Deerfield Beach has increased uh, significantly, 10.3%. Um, that is not out of bounds in terms of what other cities in the rest of the county is seeing. Uh, county average is 9.2%. And the, um, the difference there obviously is uh, still relatively the same between the Deerfield average and, and the, the county average at 79,000 last year, almost 80, and, and this year at 80, 85. Still um, the 10th lowest assessed value in Broward County, and these assessments are values as of June. I want to talk a little bit about the millage rate history. I think it's important to see the progress that the city has made as it relates to its millage rate continually going down since fiscal year uh, 15. Uh, the FY23 is an estimate because uh, although the millage, the operating millage rate remains unchanged and has remained consistent for the past three years, uh, the debt millage rate uh, continues to go down as we pay off our voter approved debt. So once we get those numbers, this slide would be updated for you in the August presentation and most likely see a little bit of a lower number. Ad valorem tax revenue, um, we've steadily seen an increase. You can see that it's a little bit higher of a, of a slope there from 22 to 23. And of course, that's an indication of the housing market uh, boom that we've seen here uh, in South Florida and in Deerfield Beach. As everyone knows, we have a CRA and a portion of our tax revenue is dedicated to the CRA. Uh, the total tax estimate for collections is 55.5 million. 2.3 million of that will go to the CRA, leaving the city with 53.2 million. One mill generates about 8.8 .8 million for the city. And the taxable uh, value increase this year was 8.5%. The estimate last year for the increase was, I think, around 4.7%. And then the revised um, 
increase provided this year by Broward County Property Appraiser brought us up to about 5%. Everyone in the county is seeing around these numbers of the 8.5% increase in the taxable value of properties. Last year, we had a 7.27% increase in taxable value for property. But a 7.27%. 7 .7%. Thank you. Uh, I'll now go ahead and turn it over to um, Ms. Tinsley to discuss the, uh, the revenue estimates. Thank you. Can you hear me? Good. Okay. Thank you. So the revenue estimates for, um, for, and this is across all funds, and this is just at a point in time um, right now, it's going to be an ongoing process until um, we actually get to a proposed budget um, for the city manager. Um, but the initial revenue estimates, as we uh, just discussed, is the property tax um, has an increase of almost 3.3 million. And again, that's related to the assessed um, values um, rising against the um, maintaining the same uh, millage rate. Mm -hmm. uh, the next big um, adjustment uh, to down is the uh, fire assessment fees. And just as um, Dave discusses, we, we had a uh, study that we just finished executing. And based on the rate proposal that the city manager will be coming uh, to you with in, in July, um, that rate against all of the other information provided for from the fire um, rescue, it will generate $17.5 million in uh, revenue, which is an increase of one point, almost 1.5 million. The issue that, that we have with the, with the current rate is that the experience has changed since we originally did the study three years ago. And so there is a higher call volume within residential. So if we maintain the rate that we have today, you'd actually see a lower uh, revenue and a greater general fund uh, contribution to the fire to the overall fire services budget. Um, we're going to be presenting you various scenarios of um, of rates to include keeping it the same today to um, a 100% funding of what we would be able to fund, which I think is around 21 million. Um, this is a, is a placeholder, obviously, for that discussion at this point. And um, again, we will be talking with you further on, on the various options with the city commission related to the fire assessment fee. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Mayor, yes. Mayor, how would you like us to handle this? There's no buttons to let you, we want to speak. Well, everybody else has a button except for you. Oh. So. <laughs> <laughs> So I think we've handled it, if that's all right. Oh, uh, no, did you just go ahead and it, it, it ask to speak, and that's fine. Um, the placeholder number that you have for the fire assessment fee for the proposed 17.42, uh, 17.462 million, mm -hmm. uh, is that based on a residential rate of 309? That is that is correct. So the um the three the, the four scenarios that i thought would be most appropriate for the city commission to look at would be one um the current rate obviously which would bring in a little bit less revenue than what we are today and then two a scenario that would bring in the same amount of revenue as we do today and then the 309 is a scenario that would bring in the same percentage of revenue as was adopted in 2000 for fiscal year 2020. Uh, so in other words, and, and, I, and I don't have all that in front of me, but just for, for argument's sake, let's just say that in 2020, the rate was adopted and the fire assessment fee was funding 30% of the overall cost. So the 309 represents maintaining that percentage of contribution. And then, of course, there's the full blown amount of the fire assessment fee that um, is is much higher, and obviously, um, okay. All right, and then um, 
about four or five lines down under the intergovernmental grants and contributions. Um, you see the big drop of 9.8 million. That's essentially the spend down of the ARPA funds. Um, that is the that ten million dollars for uh, the move the replacement of the um, the public safety DSO contract expenses that you uh, voted on a few few uh, meetings ago. Okay, um, and then a few more down. I was supposed to highlight this. So I apologize. Uh, loan proceeds. Uh, again, a drop of 3.4 million. That is the spend down of uh, bond funds related to the CIP projects that are underway um, and, and being um, under development and the, the spend against that. And then the final line item, the use of fund balance. Again, we haven't um, gotten to a point of the proposed full proposed budget. We're still assessing uh, expenditures and we need the and a, a final CIP uh, proposed proposal and so that that's part of the um, discussion about how much fund balance we're, we're going to be using uh, related to that and to some other areas as well and this is fund balance across all funds so not just the general fund but also uh, the various enterprise funds as well um, some of the other uh, line items like the charges for services and the um, interfund transfers, those are also a work in process. Uh, the charges for services includes um, uh, charges for the parks and rec and the enterprise funds. And uh, we'll, I will be getting back, we'll be getting back uh, through a second or third round with the uh, departments to go over their estimates and see if we can sharpen our pencils a little bit more and um, turn over every rock and then go into our neighbor's um, mm -hmm. area and turn over their rocks to get some more money uh, mm -hmm. to come into the city. One of the things I want to point out is the local option gas tax, which you would think would go up based on the uh, how much we're all paying for gas uh, right now. But uh, the governor has done a uh, uh, sales tax holiday and the sales tax holiday for gas will be October through November. So we know that we're going to have um, some impact on that, mm -hmm. um, which is why right now you see a negative number. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think that's, that's it. Okay. Unless there's any questions, I move on. Okay. And this slide, a um, little difficult to see. However, big picture, um, the big almost half to the right is the property taxes. And so this is this is all of the sources of funds for the general fund and almost 40% or actually, I'm sorry, it's almost 50%, it's 46% is from property taxes. Um, the other um, areas such as uh, charges for services and um, fire assessment fees, another air, those two areas, the darker blue, um, High slice and then the green, the, the the green slice. Those are other two areas where there's um, control, more control at a local level. Um, and those putting those two together give you about 29%. Um, the other areas are not so much in our control, um, but uh, they do help to round out the full uh, gamut of revenues that are available to us for the general fund. And then the next slide is um, your city taxes. So this is um, just a, mm -hmm. an estimate based on a low of uh, if a property was valued at 100,000, the median or the average um, assessed value at uh, 198, 168, and that comes from the BCPA. And then uh, property C at the higher end, uh, we bumped it up a little bit um, from uh, to 450. And so, and then of course, with the homestead exemption, the 50,000 applied across the board and getting the final value uh, with an estimated uh, tax rate of 6.3125. The Avalon taxes due. 
uh, would be those amounts, 315 for property A, 935 property B, and 25, a little over 2,500 for property C. And so on a daily rate, it's about 86 cents um, for the low end, for the median is $2.56, and then uh, for the higher end, $6.92. There's a difference between the assessed value and then the taxable value. So here, this is a re in relation to the taxable value because the taxable value is actually what is, you're going to pay. On this next slide, this is really just a depiction. Uh, I think it's important to show uh, the public, most importantly, about your total tax bill. And so the city of Deerfield, your tax bill, when you get it, you're paying a total millage of 20.469 mills. The city of Deerfield Beach represents only 30.8% of that. Uh, there are other taxing authorities on your tax bill to include Broward County, the school board, North Broward Hospital District, South Florida Water Management District, and the Children's Services Council. Some things that, um, again, we, we're considering within this budget on a, on a very high level is inflation, the local uh, housing market, a bear market scenario, and economic uncertainty. Uh, we're also currently uh, implementing the pay and class study we expect that to be complete in FY23, and that could uh, have an impact on our uh, personnel costs in the future. We already talked a little bit about the fire assessment fee study and recommendation. Um, additionally, we've uh, seen both now our external auditors make an observation about our, the health of our solid waste fund. Um, and as we budgeted this year, we're doing the, uh, the fee assessment on that one. Um, additionally, you know, my goal is to minimize, uh, obviously at any point, uh, any fee increase. One of the things that um, I have just recently been uh, notified of is a conversation that our disposal contractor would like to have with me in relation to uh, costs. We have uh, enjoyed the lowest cost uh, in the county for quite some time. And um, it's my understanding that uh, our current contractor is having difficulty maintaining our, our contract at the current level. So I don't know where that conversation is gonna go, um, but I certainly am not looking forward to it next Friday. And I will make you all aware of, of how that goes and, and uh, see where it goes from there. Um, we also talked about uh, recently our utility rate and how we are going to analyze, reanalyze the long-term recommendations of that utility rate. We're currently doing that. And then um, something that you'll notice in this budget is some considerable price increases on the personnel side, but it's related to the reallocation of non-departmental expenses. Up until this year, we have had a very large non-departmental account where pension expenses, insurance allocations, um, other contractual services, debt services, and a lot of transfers in and out resided. Um, the philosophy of this CFO is that nothing is non-departmental. All these expenses really belong somewhere. And so for instance, the insurance allocations, the pension expenses for certain departments belong in those departments. And so you're gonna see, you're gonna see that as we move forward to the next two days. Um, if there's no questions on the, on the, now is the time for questions on, on the intro portion of this presentation. And if there are none, I can move on to the capital improvement program. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Well, that's not good. Give me a moment.
-hmm. Okay. Moving on for the uh, the capital, the CIP project requests. I'm going to go through them myself for the sake of time. And if there's any specific questions, I'm happy to bring up the directors to go into further detail uh, should you have specific questions related to the projects. And what we're going to do is we're going to give an overview of the five year CIP, but then we're going to speak specifically about the FY23 request. So here is a representation of the capital improvement program uh, for the general fund. Next, we have the five-year capital program for the utility fund. This is the five-year program for the stormwater fund. Next, we have the road and bridge fund. Going into the, the general fund projects, the first uh, capital improvement project is a backup upgrade. This is in relation to our IT infrastructure and additional backup, um, a backup system to mitigate risks and increase our resiliency, uh, keeping in line with, uh, you know, current practices and, and, and best methods of, of backing up our, our data. Proposing to replace the Crystal Heights North Playground in total cost of 175,000 is a general fund expense. Um, last installed in 2008, we typically have playgrounds have a typical life, lifespan of eight to 10 years. Uh, they've done a great job of keeping up to uh, standards, but it is time to replace that particular playground. Discussing um, replacing uh, or actually adding a restroom in Constitution Park on the on the outside. This would be a prefab installed restroom similar to what you see at Pioneer Park. There's currently uh, some temporary restrooms there, um, but this would install a more permanent structure. Uh, the cost is 150,000 would come from general operating funds. Uh, we've, uh, we're seeking uh, some grant funding for the replacement of the Alita McKeithen Pavilion. It's a total cost projected at $200,000. We've got grant funding through the National Recreation and Parks Association, as well as through CDBG funding. The bulkhead at the Aquatic Center, this is virtually a, a mobile canopy that they use uh, during events, during swimming events. The total cost is $250,000. The existing uh, structures that we have, they're not mobile, they're in place. And um, they are, th these would assist us in moving. Actually, I think I'm, 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 um, I'm, I'm messing this up with a, a different capital project. This is actually a bulkhead that separates the pool um, to allow for, for more activity and, and you can separate it and have certain events going on on one side and other events going in on the other side. I apologize for that. We need to take a look at the, uh, the structural uh, integrity of the pier. Although it is certainly structurally sound right now, we do know the age of the pier. We noticed that we're starting to get um, screws that are sticking up a little bit. And that's simply because we're driving them down as far as we can. And we can't get them to go any further. So we need to take a look at the pier and get a structural assessment done so we know what type of capital improvements we need to do to it in the future. The total cost for that is, is $100,000 and it's from general fund operating. Oh, Johnny L. Tigner Fitness Center, FF&E, this is furniture, fixture, and equipment related to the construction project for the Johnny L. Tigner Center. The estimated value is 370,000 from general fund operating expenses. We continue with our, our city parking lot uh, resurfacing projects. Um, this is actually a new program over the past, uh, I believe this will be the third year. And this will look at doing some improvements to the city hall or more specifically the BSO parking lot. This is on the other side of city hall. So we have two parking lots over there um, that need to be resurfaced and, um, and, and upgraded. So the total cost is $140,000 on that. Uh, this is an important one, something that I think 
um, we actually just talked about at our last city commission meeting. And this is in relation to citywide median improvements for this next current or next fiscal year. Uh, the estimated cost is $250,000. Um, and this is in line with the plan that was provided and discussed at the last commission meeting, uh, as well as not only with the, the, the various plant material, but the way in which we, we're going to go about doing that strategically with the entryways and then moving in as um, discussed with the commission. Question? Yes. You have 150,000 for the uh, medians for fiscal year 24. Um, what's what's that for? Can can we not move that up into fiscal year 2023? This was, <coughs> as, as discussed, this was a priority of the commission that we've been discussing. What's the carryover into the next fiscal year? Okay. Um, Commissioner Drosky, can I, I'd like to bring up Miss Terry Renard to, to to talk on that if if I can. Do you want me? I can do that now, or I can wait until we get through. It's on my. I'll leave it up to the mayor, but it's on my brain now. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you, um, and good evening, Commissioner and Commissioner, or Mayor and Commissioners. The um, the idea of the those four kind of key points are the 250, and then the 150 is as we work our way into the city. I will say I have probably, I'm not gonna say grossly. I think I've underestimated on both years, but the first year is really to focus on those four entryways and then work our way in that's why it's less let me turn the microphone on sorry um i thought we were talking about maybe getting some outside help with this project yes, too for sure. so we can't fast track the inner part too as well it has to take two fiscal years uh i would love that i just was trying not to be too greedy with the request uh, i mean i my, my colleagues are all here. We discussed this as a priority for the for the city. It's kind of low hanging fruit. Um, but there's an opportunity to bring that into this fiscal year. I think that's something that I would like to see considered. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Too. Thank you. Are we able to do that? Right. So it's that's a that's a great question. Um, I also understand that this is just a CIP within the Parks and Recreational Maintenance Operating Budget. Our funds for a lot of the work that they're going to do internally. This is more geared towards what Commissioner Drosky was talking about. With we're going to need contractual service to do these major projects. So um, with with this feedback, which is great, we can certainly add. To this, to this uh, particular item, to do more in the in you know upfront, um, it's always in relation to you know what we we can what we can manage from a funding perspective. I will say, um, and I, I did not say yet, but I will say it at this point. I think we're going to be in a good place with our fund balance in order to um, move some of the fund balance that we see when we present the annual uh, consolidated financial report in July over into uh, the capital the capital fund in order to fund a lot of these capital projects. I think we're going to be in good shape to do that. Um, so we can certainly do that. I think I just want to make sure that it, that it's understood that we we're going to start this in, in fiscal year, you know, in, Octo in October. We know that we have to go through a significant permitting process with FDOT. We're going to try to fast track that as quickly as possible. And then we have to go ahead and, and uh, procure and contract for, for these services to get them going. So again, we have the operating dollars right now, so we can do all these, do a lot of internal work, but the major work, we can, we can certainly look at uh, consolidating the budget into one fiscal year to get that moving a lot quicker. I mean, do you have to spend the 140 for the parking lot of resurfacing of City Hall now? One of the things that we discussed and we held off on the City Hall renovations was one, because the cost of the Center for Active Aging and the Tigner Center went up and did leave us that buffer. 
Uh, but two, there may be opportunities, you know, for B3, for City Hall, or the BSO next door. Uh, we have a lot of assets in, in play. So if, if maybe wait a year and see where we go with that. I mean, that's 140 right there, which would offset the, the medians um, almost dollar, dollar for dollar. I'd like to see where we're going with the City Hall project before we start dumping a lot of money into it. So the parking lot improvements are a lower priority for you? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Um, the restrooms at Mayo Howard, the assessment by our parks director has um, convinced me that the restrooms over there are in horrible shape. Uh, we actually went out there ourselves and took a look at them. They, they are really in bad shape. And quite honestly, uh, they're also a, a septed uh, issue in the way that they're structured. They're on the back side of the building. So from a safety perspective, they, they, they're not in uh, up to our, uh, what we should want in terms of standards. The cost on that is 160,000. I think the approach there is the same as Constitution Park uh, restrooms where it would be a prefabricated uh, structure. Uh, I've seen plenty of examples of these and they really don't, there's so many new options now with these prefab uh, restrooms that the, you really can't tell that they're actually prefabricated. Additionally, the pavilion at uh, Mayo Howard is attached to the restroom. So we'd be look at re looking at replacing that. Um, and there is another pavilion over at OMRC that we're looking at uh, replacing as well. This is not the main gazebo, but another pavilion. Cost there is 220,000 and their general fund operating expenses. There's two other playgrounds at Crystal Heights Central and, uh, and Mayo Howard as well. Um, these playgrounds are, uh, have outlived their useful life, one being built in 2008 and the other one in 2014. Uh, the proposed cost to replace these two are 300,000 um, and uh, they come from a general, general fund expense. We uh, are just wrapping up the Pioneer Park uh, boat ramp project. Uh, I actually expect that to be done by the end of the week and reopened. We will have some minor closures to uh, maintain some concrete spalling that uh, we need to take care of, but uh, they, they do have the, uh, as of today, they do have the floating dock in, so uh, we will be operational by, by this, this weekend. Uh, I went by there myself today. Um, major improvement. The one pier that will be left is the one that runs along the seawall, which is generally the fishing pier. So we want to go ahead and uh, do the development of that for replacement of that in a future year at $85,000. Uh, we have, we have uh, uh, over 489 interior and exterior openings in this city. And just over the course of decades, the key management system has become extremely complex. So we really need to redo that and, and maintain a better key management system. This is for a security perspective uh, throughout the city. Uh, the cost for the first year is 85,000. Once we get done with our city facilities, the idea would be then to go to uh, the Broward Sheriff's Office, the, excuse me, not the Broward Sheriff's Office, but the BSO facilities owned by the city and do that in the, in the next year. Uh, we just re received uh, state grant funding for to take care of a drainage issue at the middle school aquatics parking lot, uh, which floods quite often. Um, so we're very happy to get that state funding there. I believe that was an appropriation request that we put in. The CRA board recently approved a contract for the replacement of the sea turtle bollards. The contract, this is gonna be an important one and it's important that I say it in this way, that the approval of that contract and the full purchase order for that expense will require the CRA will be will be um, basically issuing the purchase order for the entire city. This capital project is should will need to be a high priority for the city in order to reimburse the CRA uh, for that expense to complete that project. A uh, quick question. Um, now, is this just the bollards in the CRA? Because I know at one point we're going to be expanding that to include the bollards 
that is on that is not in the CRA. You're 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 absolutely uh, correct, Commissioner. So the um, the contract amount that was awarded by the CRA was for the complete project. Mm -hmm. This is the portion that the city will be on the hook for for the city's portion. Thank you. You're welcome. We're going to continue on. We'd like to continue on with our lifeguard replacement program. Uh, we just approved two of these lifeguard towers. Uh, that'll be for the new tower on the north end and then what is currently lifeguard tower one. This would get us to uh, towers two and three. Uh, the one thing I do want to point out to the commission is that towers two through six reside all in the same area, which is before the curve. So, I mean, I just, again, want to point out that we'll have We'll keep replacing two every year. We'll get us. We'll get us done by 2026, um, and that's that's the plan at this point. And this, I'm sorry, this 435, 60, 600, um, that's to replace two two towers. Two towers, because I I thought the cost went up to 221 a piece right now. It it it, it it's two yes it's 220 220 a piece. Right. So we'll have to revise the the, the CIP for the, for the yeah, additional cost. It was at 170 and then it went up to 220. Mm -hmm. So that 435 is going to go up to 500 by the time we get there. No, that's a locked in cost at, at the moment. Wonderful. Thank you. I, I did see online where someone said they could have it done for $5,000. I take it that's inaccurate. <laughs> I, I don't think I'd want to put my lifeguards in that tower. Okay. I was just checking because the guy's so bright. I figured you know, he was accurate with that. We're all very familiar with the joint uh, beach renourishment project with the town of Hillsborough Beach. Um, this is the CIP for that. Uh, we're still in permitting. There's no guarantees. Uh, we're at the we're at the will of the uh, the permitting agencies at this point. So um, we're just waiting on them. The town knows that. We know that. Um, but this remains in the CIP and is funded by American Rescue Plans by the American Rescue Plan until such time as we can actually move forward with that project. Um, you know, there is the opportunity, hopefully, for reimbursement from um, Florida Department of Environmental Protection, um, but we can't bet on that at this point. Um, so, as we said, I think through the ARP um, program, that we will will commit to funding this through the ARP, and then if we get additional funding from uh, Department of Environmental Protection, great. We'll free up money for other projects through the ARP. And, and we're looking at ways of, of, of possibly circumventing the amount of sand that, that we are losing on an annual basis. Um, we, we always look at ways that we can retain our, our, our sand. Um, and, uh, and that's something that also the, um, the granting or not the granting agency, but the permitting agencies look at as well. So okay. sometimes they come, they come to us with certain stipulations as it relates to, you know, the beach, the overall beach management plan. Okay. And we do have a, an improved beach management plan. Uh, this is the vehicle request out of the um, general fund. It includes a rescue and an engine, as well as various other vehicles and equipment. Now moving on to the utility fund. Uh, addressing the living conditions that they are presently in. And it's, it's, it's not that they're not good, it's deplorable. And, and when are we going to begin to address that bottom line? Sure. And, and we actually have some slides in that in the presentation for fire rescue. Um, I agree that some of the facilities are, are, are in, you know, they're not new. They, they need upgraded. They don't meet current standards. Um, but I also want to, you know, just remind you of some, some, some of our accomplishments as it relates to the fire rescue facilities. Uh, we did life safety upgrades to fire station 66. So they now meet life safety, uh, all life safety requirements. Um, and we did, some, I think we did some interior renovations there. Fire station 75, we did in interior and exterior renovations. We did, uh, took care of concrete sprawling, sprawling, excuse me. 
and we're installing a uh, dedicated generator for fire station 75 to ensure that it's operational um, even in a storm. Uh, the, the fire station 111, which is the trailer over by Goolsby, was just replaced in its entirety. So it's a brand new modular uh, fire station. So um, that was a, a vast improvement over what was there. And here in just uh, a, less than a month, we'll be doing the grand opening for fire station 51. Uh, which is a brand new fire station and facility, um, much better than the one that that was actually was in Pompano Beach Fire Station 51, and recently recently um, they continually floods over there and, and that that station, and they're now out of it. So, um, you know, we've been been doing many improvements to the to the the fire stations. Um, uh, I've spoken with some of the firefighters uh, at the uh, dedication ceremony for rescue or engine 66. And um, although I think that you know, they realize that, um, and, and I know that, that some of our other facilities need to be addressed, particularly Fire Station 75, um, Fire Station 4, and the modular over at 111, um, I was encouraged by them recognizing the efforts that the city has made and the dollars that we've put towards some of these facilities. Well, you know, I'll tell you, I'm sure they're appreciative, but I'm going to tell you where we need to go. We need to go with a modern updated multi-city complex for the fire department that we have we have a not a good fire department an unbelievable fire department those guys are qualified the the, the men and women that are there deerfield beach is actually a standout in the county but the way that they're living we might as well put them under the bridge we need to do a better job we have to that's where we need to go and we need to think not just in terms of you know, um, just upgrading band-aids, that sort of thing. We need to think big, whatever that means. You know, of the city, if we if we need bond, if we need to to explore getting a bond to do what we need to do. Just as we are paying attention to these things, and we need to, we need to pay attention to those things that often time that we take for granted. Jump in. Sure. So, um, sure, I agree. Uh, I agree, but that's not something we're going to do within these funds or, or in our, our general budget. We're going to have to go out to a bond, like that's you, like you, like you, yeah, like you we're said. And so, we're going to have to craft whatever that payment is as part of you know budget going forward. Um, but I agree. It's just it's kicking the can down down the road uh, too many times. It's got to be approved by the voters too. And so we're going to have coming up the um, hopefully an election on that part of site for the public to approve whatever we decide is going to go there after the consultant comes back with hopefully a, a bold recommendation for us. Um, maybe when that goes on the ballot, the bond goes on as well. And I, I, I kind of floated the idea to the, to the city manager too, that now might be the time to start thinking about that and working uh, actively to, to working on that. If we're going to put the part of site on the ballot, let's put the, the bond for parks um, and the fire stations uh, at the same time. And my thought, my, my so let's, thought let's, process. Let's, uh, let's think about it. But I mean, there's a budget element to it. But I'm I'm all for discussing it. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I was just saying, Commissioner. You know, we can't have any of these things take place until we um, change the thought process. They're giving attention to it just in the thought process. From out of the thought process, perhaps that we can get a workable plan. And so that was the idea of. Of, of my my point tonight, it's a it's a it's huge that we began to go that way, and I understand that how that relates to what we're doing. I I, I agree. I mean, um, first thing you find out after being elected is that there's always a plan for government, and it goes a lot slower than than you won, uh, because these fire stations. If we do new fire stations, they have to you know whatever the development criteria that downtown has versus what we have versus what technology is going to go in there versus what technology is coming down the line. That, there's a lot of planning and a lot of moving pieces to, to that puzzle. And maybe and maybe it's too ambitious for uh, next year to, to go on the ballot. But at least we need to talk about it and, and move that needle forward instead of kicking the can down the road, like, like you said. So um, whatever the timeline is, we need to start working on it. Thank you. In the utility fund, this represents the utility infrastructure portion of the FAU Research Boulevard uh, project. The cost just for the water and wastewater infrastructure is estimated at $600,000.
and would be uh, proposed through a debt service uh, out of the utility fund. Very similarly, uh, the Pioneer Grove project, again, and both of them are surtax funded projects from the roadway portion. Uh, this would be to improve the water and wastewater uh, in that corridor of, of Pioneer Grove um, down second to upgrade that water and wastewater utility infrastructure at $600,000. This is a water plant site security upgrade. This is to comply with federal government requirements and recommendations related to security assessment on our plant. Uh, so we're recommending a, uh, the installation of cameras and access control at various well sites and our, uh, our elevated tanks at, and then at the East water plant as well. The total cost is 270,000. Uh, here, I think we're going to hit the July meeting. If we don't, it'll be the first meeting in August for the award of the advanced meter infrastructure, and we'll be on our way with that one. Um, we just have to wrap things up with uh, the evaluation committee giving a final recommendation uh, to the city commission after, the, and this, after this has already been uh, just completed the final negotiation. We talked about the ion exchange system for the water treatment plant as a uh, next alternative to uh, the current lime softening uh, method. Uh, so this would begin uh, that endeavor of, of updating the water plant to a new uh, water treatment process at $1.8 million. The reclaimed water line is in association with the Southwest 10th Street project. Uh, we still have not gotten anything definitive from the Florida Department of Transportation on what they are going to fund or willing to fund. But as you know, we have uh, also seek other funding through state revolving loans. Uh, so between the two of them, uh, we still believe that this project and uh, the timing of it with the ability to you know, be underground already with the Southwest 10th Street project is, is, the, uh, is the best time to do it. And the total projected cost right now is $7 million. This is, represents the vehicle and equipment request from the utilities fund uh, for the various uh, equipment that they need, whether it be a vehicle, a backhoe, or a, a new dump truck. Within the stormwater fund, <clears throat> This particular uh, project is not in relation to any particular area. However, throughout the year, we know that we have stormwater projects that we must tackle um, as they come up, similar to like when you have a water main break or anything like that. Uh, we'd like to program uh, 400,000 if we can uh, for those, those, those situations. These are, not, these are beyond repair and maintenance with, that would come out of the operating budget. Um, and allows us to build up uh, some capital for stormwater projects in the near term and the long term. We're all familiar with the 8th Ave Stormwater Capital Project. Uh, this is the funding for that construction portion of the project at $2.4 million. Likewise, West Deerfield, particularly Deer Run, this represents the construction portion of that project and an estimated 4.9. Uh, these costs have gone up since we originally estimated them based on of the new uh, designs that are getting closer to completion. Um, we had a 30% design that was the original, that provided us the original estimate. Um, and now that they're getting closer to, I believe, 60%, um, there these, these costs are being refined. And so, uh, we're looking at both enterprise funding, the grant funding, and debt to, to fund these projects. And by grant, what I'm talking about there is the, the ARP funding that we've dedicated for these projects. The following represents uh, the vehicle and equipment requests uh, out of the stormwater plan currently, uh, which is a dump truck couple additional are replacement vehicles and a, a second street sweeper to uh, increase our compliancy with uh, fe uh, federal and state requirements as it relates to our, our, our permits and increase that program. 
under road and bridge. Um, this here is the actual roadway project as it relates to uh, FAU Research Boulevard. Um, this is the one that is uh, being requested through surtax dollars. Additionally, uh, this is the roadway portion of the Pioneer Grove corridor that um, handles the, just the roadway portion. Again, everything underground um, does not is not covered by the surtax. So uh, this would be, the project is actually on Southeast 2nd Ave. It's from Eller to 10th Street, it includes Southeast 4th Street from Dixie to Southeast 2nd Avenue and Eller from the railroad to Northeast 6th Avenue. We've been awarded a lap project for a uh, safe routes to, I think this is safe routes to school. Yes, safe routes to school for both Deerfield Elementary and Middle School. So we'll be doing some sidewalk and pedestrian improvements in those areas. The cost of that project is approximately $500,000. City, re City bridge rehabilitation. Um, we, we do have funding for the repair of, of one of the bridges, as we said, in the surtax program. Um, one of them was approved in this cycle, hopefully in a future cycle, the other bridge will, uh, will be approved for funding. This is not in relation to those. This is to build, start to build a, a capital reserve for the, for the repair or, and or replacement of our bridges throughout the city. Right now we don't have that mechanism. So if we have the ability to put dollars away for the future repair of our bridges, knowing the, the, the immense cost that it, it costs to repair or replace a bridge, we'd like to do that. The, F, the FEC fence has been a, a, a tremendous project and has been um, has received accolades from, from many people throughout the county. It's also caught the attention of um, Representative Ted Deutsch, and he actually approached us to see if, to, to ensure that we submit an appropriation request uh, to try to complete the, the fence all the way down to, to our border. Um, so we have we have submitted that. So it's it's definitely got some legs. Um, hopefully that gets approved, and the uh, appropriation request for that was two point six million dollars. Following represents the vehicle and equipment uh, list for for that fund. Going on to the solid waste fund. All their requests are uh, vehicles and equipment, a replacement vehicle of a, of a, of a light duty truck, uh, and as well as some additional heavy equipment uh, out in there in the field, side loaders, grapple truck, and a front end loader. And that concludes the presentation for the CIP, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. I'm going to continue on. Uh, we're going to continue on with the, since I do have Stephanie here, we're going to continue on with the finance, uh, financial services presentation. I apologize that I, my, my longer presentation that had everything consolidated together, is not working appropriately, but I do have the individual ones I'll, I'll bring up and, and continue on with. Thank you. So, um, financial services, uh, just go through some of the recent achievements. I'm not going to read all of these. I'm just going to highlight some of the ones that uh, I think are important. Um, I think I have one of the best teams uh, in, the, in, uh, in the city, if not the best. And uh, these are their achievements in front of you. And so um, some of the, and you'll see um, with some of our slides that it's not just the department themselves, but it, there is a partnership with others. And so um, you see a lot of IT uh, in, with mine. Uh, we do do a lot of, of projects together and um, I need them uh, in order to be successful. And so um, 
the business license tax from Navaline to GovEasy is one of the one of the big ones. GovEasy, um, we are a pilot or first in to build a business license tax with GovEasy, and so uh, we work very closely uh, with planning, IT, and the um, consultants in order to do that. One of the uh, it has a twofold effect. It not only do we get out of Navaline, which is an, an older system, but um, it also helps in the prep for the ERP. Um, some of the other uh, successes are there as well. Uh, the banking fee reduction, again, working with public safety, we saved um, upwards of 70000 That also had a component of IT as well. So our current initiatives, again, um, many. I want to just highlight um, a few. So the fire inspection billing and collections, we are, we are actively working to get it off of uh, a very old antiquated um, system called Firehouse and also move that to GovEasy. Again, um, multiple facets to this. It gets us off of an old antiquated system another third party type um, and consolidated with GovEZ. And um, again, prepping us for ERP. These are two things we will not have to worry about. We can focus on our core needs with the ERP system. It can't be everything to us, but it can be um, what we need. Um, and of course, we continue as, as was already discussed, doing some uh, business process cleanup, uh, fiscal year end and part as well as budget um, with the non-departmental cleanup and some other ones as well. Um, and so, and also uh, some customer service enhancements. We're improving our website and that's in partnership with uh, Pam as well. I should put that there um, in cleaning up our websites and making it more customer service friendly as well as doing some uh, more self-service uh, opportunities with the lobby. And then uh, future considerations. Uh, again, not gonna go through everything, but uh, one of the big uh, things that we will be looking uh, is the AG operational audit results. Those are um, right behind us. We are um, going to get those results probably within the next uh, few months. The cost allocation plan is important as well. Um, there's, that's part of continued uh, process improvements and cleaning up and being more transparent in how our allocations or in administrative fees are, are being calculated and done. And so um, I come from a, a background where we've done cost allocation plans and we do it like every four or five years uh, just to solidify um, how things are being allocated um, from the general fund to the enterprise funds and vice versa and things like that. Um, and um, open gov implementation uh, that will help uh, tremendously in our budget development process. Currently it's a, a very manual tedious process and um, we, we're trying to figure out a better way to do it. And OpenGov is one of the best in class uh, software systems that will help uh, do, to help us with uh, budget development. And so, and again, takes us to something different and focuses more uh, squarely on the needs of our ERP system. Oh, and then finally the AMI um, and voice interactive those are two customer service related uh, initiatives. Um, with the AMI or the meter reading, uh, automated uh, meter reader is one of the implications with that is that the customer service reps will be um, having to use two systems while the meters are being um, upgraded over a course of three, possibly four years. So, um, it's going to be like a parallel going through into both systems um, until all the meters are brought over to the one system. So just some consideration there on capacity. And then the IVR or pay by phone, uh, we find that our, um, uh, our um, some of our, our, our clientele prefer to do pay by phone than through the internet. 
And so this provides that opportunity as well for them, a, a different option to, to do their pay. And so uh, moving on to the numbers. So, um, so far the requested, uh, this is the overall uh, financial services department, uh, the three main divisions uh, along with uh, utility customer service, which really rolls up under the accounting and treasury management. So these are the four budget units. And we can move to the next. All right, so then the accounting and treasury management, um, not a, a lot of changes here. Uh, there were uh, transfers that were done in FY22 to accommodate uh, temporary contractual services while we work through um, uh, filling positions. And as we already talked about, and, and this will be seen in all most of the departments, um, it does take a little bit longer time period to uh, fill positions. Um, and then as we talked about the non-departmental, you'll see that across the board as well. And then the other slight change is that our revenue collections manager salary allocation originally was 100% utilities, but uh, we did some um, reorgan reorganization within um, financial services to take uh, advantage of um, skill sets and um, synergies. And uh, she's also overseeing uh, business license tax and the fire uh, inspection uh, billing as well. So it's billing and billing. Budget and performance. Okay, budget and performance, similar, um, only major change. Uh, or what you see with the um, the dollar change is really just because of temporary services uh, transfer from personnel for vacant positions in order to cover trend. And then uh, purchasing and contract administration, similar. I'm sorry, can you say that again, what you said about the oh. temporary services again? Yeah, so in FY22 current, um, we had a vacant, we, have a vacant position and so what is that vacant position what um it's the budget and uh budget performance and uh, analysts okay yeah and that's currently out um on the recruitment that was a new position that was um approved in fy22 and so uh, we built the job description and got it out onto the street okay okay in the meantime, we, we, we acquired temp services to, to assist. Um, the purchasing and contract administration, similar results. Um, now currently have two uh, vacant positions and um, augmented with temp services. And so we did transfer from personnel to operating to accommodate that. So we can keep up with the um, priorities in each of the areas. And then uh, finally, customer service operations. And so again, that, that slight decrease in personnel is because of the, um, we're reallocating uh, the revenue collections manager, um, utilities and general fund. And then bank charges, um, huge increase. Um, and that'll be across the board where bank charges are charged. Uh, postage increase. Uh, similar as well as the IVR, which we talked about as an initiative or, or future consideration, implementation of $30,000. Just to um, discuss a little bit what bank charges are, they're, they're credit card fees. So the credit card fees are, are going up. Those are not necessarily charges that we can directly control, um, uh, but we are we do continue to see an increase in those in those charges, whether it be for payment on utility bills or um, or parking meters, whatever, wherever somebody uses a credit card within the city, those charges are going up. Because we get charged those those fees. Any questions? Questions for me? I have several. Um, this is, a, I have last year's budget request, I have this year's budget request, and I'm looking at all the information that's in here. What is the holdup with the ERP and why is it taking so long? 
Year after year, we've been talking about an ERP, and we don't seem to make any progress. And I'm trying to understand why. So, um, and um, my apologies for not providing more updates along the way. Um, the ERP project is basically a capital improvement project for our system. And so currently we are in the design phase of it. And um, we have the, what is called, um, we have our consultant on board, which is the GFOA, um, which is the Government Financial Officers Association. And one of the reasons why we went with them is because you will hear from the Auditor General uh, some of the recommendations that they are making to, for us is based on GFOA recommendations. Right. So last so, year we approved for GFOA, GFOA correct. to go through for the process analysis. That was last year. And where are we at now and when will this be done? So where we are right now, we will be issuing the RFP in July of this year, this next July, this next month because we have gone through that process. We've analyzed um, multiple business processes. Um, one of the things that for me, I've seen what happened here as well as in, in other places where we ram in a system and we're not taking into account the importance of what we do. And so the ERP system is a tool for people. We need two things to run the city and the city financials and to be fiscally responsible. We need people and we need the tools to do it. And so the people and the tools um, together make, make up what we do to be fiscally responsible. Our budget is 200 plus $200 million. That's actually double. It's $200 million coming in revenues of, of, of coming in, as well as $200 million going out. And so that system has to handle the velocity of $400 million coming in and out, and that we have to be accountable for it down to every nickel, every dime. And so I do take that very seriously. And I don't want us to make the same mistake that it sounds like it's happened here, which ram in something we do. Now we're doing a massive cleanup in order to correct the issues so that now we're ready for a better system. And um, so I, I, um, I, I wish we could move faster, but that's one of the reasons why I, I really take it seriously. I want the people that are going to be running this ERP system to understand what they're doing as well. And it was very clear to me, they didn't understand what they were doing before. Okay. so. Is this enterprise planning system going to give the ability for our employees to actually go online and make adjustments to the direct deposit or W2 forms or anything like that? Is that strictly for your accounting? Fund? So we're hoping that we can get a system that would allow for some of that. There, what? So, so hold on. Yes, we're hoping sense. we can get that. That means we don't haven't picked one yet. No, we have not picked the ERP system. We're going out for RFP okay. in July. All right. And this so is, this is taking way too long. All right. Th this is 2022. If you if we can't move forward with this faster this year, then we have some problems, big problems. Year after year, it's the same thing talking about ERP. Fix it and fast. It shouldn't take a year to go through and, and go through a process analysis to get us to this point, and now we're finally going to go out to bid. This should be done already. So wherever it's lacking, wherever the holdup is, please fix it, because this is unacceptable. It's ridiculous that we have to fill out. Somebody wants to make a change to the direct deposit, that we have to fill out a paper form and hand it in and staple a check to it. That's embarrassing. We're talking about all these other improvements that we're doing, and we can't seem to move forward on this. This impacts everybody. And it needs to be done. I appreciate taking the time to get it done right, but this is lollygag as far as I'm concerned. So there's a breakdown somewhere, and please fix it. And please get it done ASAP. Okay. You know, my other question is this, because I'm looking again. This this is all repeat stuff that I don't understand. I don't quite understand. We're talking about now. You want to bring in an IVR, but yet we haven't completed our our meter reading part of it. We didn't do the ARM, right? That didn't get done. 
That was in last year's budget. The although they're they're both related to customer service, it is a separate project. It's not related. The interactive voice response. No, no, it's not. That's a new project you guys want to take on, but you didn't complete last year's projects. So why are you taking on a new project when you completed last year's? Last year's was the meter reader. We didn't do that. You're asking for it to do it again this year. Why wasn't that done? The meter reading was was held up in negotiation. The negotiation is complete and coming before the city commission in either July or August. Okay. I, I just look at this and I see it's the same stuff year after year. And I don't see progress here at all at a level that should be happening in my opinion. Um, so uh, I, I think before we take on any new projects, just complete the projects we've been talking about for a few years and get it done right and get it done quickly. Because if you're spread so thin, and that's what I'm hearing, we don't have the right personnel there, even though we approved quite a bit of uh, positions for you last year in this department that I can see here that should have taken care of this. I could be wrong, but this is what I'm seeing. Should have been only one position. For me. Which was that, full-time ca cashier receptionist? That was the only one we filled? So um, the the one new position was for the budget. Okay. That was the budget uh, performance and analyst. All right. So last year we had ERP and all these other things on there. We didn't make the request for personnel to move those things forward. We're making the request this year to move those things forward. Is that what I'm understanding? That you don't have enough personnel to do this? I did not request any new positions. This year? Correct. Okay. For FY23. So what is the holdup? Why is this not getting done? Is it people? It, is it system? Is it the people who are in place now aren't able to do it? It's, it's a combination of all. So I do have vacancies, and those vacancies are taking longer to fill. I've gone through two, three recruitments in order to try to fill positions, in which case, which is why we went through to do temp services to bring those in. Same stories I'm told from the temp services as well is that it's been very challenging to get people um, for our position. Okay. And so we're changing the way that we um, working with the city manager. We're changing job descriptions, adjusting them a little bit. Are we adjusting um, the qualifications in hopes of getting a better pool? So we go. And currently, I'm also using a recruiting firm in order to um, assist with filling one of the positions that I'm now in my third recruitment for. Um, it's a tough. I, I'm hearing it the same thing all, all from not only the recruiter, from the temp services, and just the experience alone has been very challenging to fill our positions. And so I'm hoping the paying class study would help to um, to provide um, answers to help. So these vacancies are the holdup, is what you're saying? And the ERP. The spots, is that right? I have currently vacant four. So those four positions. So the current staff we have are incapable of moving this forward. We need those four positions filled. It, Mayor, it's not that the current staff is incapable of doing it. It's just that they have other other duties. And so when you when you lose four people, now those the people that are in place are are, are having to do additional duties to fill those, those gaps. Positions? Did we lose those positions or are those positions uh, new? Both. We've lost some positions. Okay. Um, we've lost two positions. We had one promotion into uh, into another. And we had one promotion leaving a vacancy. And then we, we, had, uh, we had a new position. Okay. So it's a combination of, of several things. Okay. But you're not asking for any positions. No, I I no. did not. But sure. I have asked for it, it's not quite reflect that they just is some offsets. But I have asked for um, additional uh, consulting services, financial consulting services. If we don't have people in place right now to do the job properly, we might need to evaluate that rather than have to go out for a consultant so many times. But this needs to be taken care of. It needs to be a high priority just moving forward. It's a disservice to all of us. Mm -hmm. So this needs to really move forward. I mean, this has been going on way too long. It's May. And uh, 
Ms. Gilliard, since I'm having issues with the final presentation, you can tell me who is next. Human resources. Human resources, thank you. Press this button right there. All right. Can everybody hear me? No. No? It's because I'm so short, isn't it? Push the button. I did. I think it's because I was so short. All right. Good evening. Amanda Robin, Director of Human Resources and Risk Management. I'll dive right into our recent achievements. I believe you all are aware that we currently revised our employee handbook a few months ago. Uh, it was a revision that was a rewrite in 2019, and we just made some corrective actions within the handbook that we realized needed to be corrected just throughout the couple years that we had the revision. We also brought forward the emergency pay policy. Um, you're well aware that's mostly for FEMA reimbursement purposes. We did revise the recruitment policy. You heard Stephanie speak about um, the, the Auditor General and one of the things that they came back with was some suggestions for our recruitment and we have already incorporated those and adopted that policy and trained our staff on it. So we're already in compliance with those. We did implement our new performance evaluation system. So as you're aware, we, we negotiated that in the new collective bargaining agreements with the unions. We did full-blown training in October and November, and that system is uh, full-blown ahead uh, about nine months now into the system. We implemented a COVID vaccine initiative as part of the wellness program where we offered a gift card to any of our employees that received that vaccine. Um, that did end after the first round, so we only did it for the first round, not for the boosters. I, I don't want to call it an achievement because I don't think COVID-19 contact tracing is an exciting achievement to report on. I just think it's important to share the amount of resources expended by the Human Resources Department to do the contact tracing. And we call it an achievement, but it's still ongoing. Um, I, I can openly admit that we have had multiple cases just this week come in that we have had to do that contact tracing and, and quarantining and isolation. We also did a citywide vehicle inventory insurance project. We partnered with Fleet to analyze not only the inventory of our fleet for insurance purposes, but also gave us the ability to add documentation for the staff that work out of a truck or a vehicle and don't have the ability to have a desk. So they all received a folder with some of the policies and procedures that relate to working into the field. So they have it handy and they're not having to go back to the office to receive it. Okay. So our current initiatives, we are working on enhanced training. Uh, one of the things that we've always had to focus on is the legal compliance trainings that we're required to. And so we're trying to slowly implement some of what I call the warm fuzzy HR trainings. So our first go at that was True Colors. We have hosted three sessions. Um, it is not mandatory for staff. It's meant to be a fun learning experience for them to learn about different personality types so that they understand how to work with each other better. We also have found out um, Bentech, our online benefits portal, has started adding additional customization for report writing. So um, sometimes we can't analyze all the costs accurately because of the reports that are able to be provided. This will allow customization based on our plans and our workforce related to everything from the pensions that they're in to the, the um, benefits that they elect. And so that will allow us to do things that are very specific to Deerfield Beach. We also now post COVID environment are able to get out and do property and asset inspections. Um, I believe that may also come up with some of the auditor staff. Uh, this was not only to make recommendations about how to um, track and, and retain your assets, but it's also about the property insurance and making sure that we're staying ahead of any issues that could arise. Um, I won't beat ERP readiness um, too much, but we are working behind the scenes in the Human Resources Department, looking at the current system, making sure that the, the codes and everything that are in there. So when we do move to an, a new ERP that it is, the data is ready to shift. And I also mentioned that because it is HR staff that are, um, will be involved in that when the, when the actual process happens and the resources there can be anywhere from 10 to 15 hours a week. And I just think that's important for everybody to know. I think everybody's aware I'm a reopener for union negotiations. It's just related to wages, uh, but obviously that is 
a big part of our time right now, um, and you'll be hearing more about that in the coming weeks. I mentioned temporary employment services on here, mostly because we are seeing an uptick in that use, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in my next slide. It has a lot to do with the current economy for why we're having to turn to temporary employment services, but why that isn't the end all be all for us. And you also will see in September, we will be bringing forward a revision of Article 4 of the city code. That's departments, divisions, offices, and agencies. It's where you find org charts in the code that just is not the place that those belong. And so this revision will bring forward to you as it does tie to the budget process. So the great resignation, I'm sure everybody has heard that uh, term used throughout media these days. And it is definitely impacting us in Deerfield Beach, I'd say probably across the country, but I can speak to we currently have 51 open vacancies that are being worked, meaning they're somewhere in the recruitment process, they are either posted or somewhere to the person has not started yet. So 51 currently active that, that my recruitment team is managing, we have over 100 vacancies. I can tell you from experience where we used to get over 100 probably 300 sometimes applicants for an administrative assistant position. We're lucky if we get 10 now. And so it definitely is driving those recruitment, which is making people want to turn to temporary employment services. And those aren't necessarily there for us either. We're also hearing that from our providers where we have longer delays in background checks because the background check companies are having struggles finding people to come to work. Um, so I, I anticipate that continuing until people are wanting to come back to work. I believe Mr. Santucci referenced the implementation of the paying class recommendations. Obviously right now we just are kicking off the paying class study. Um, we looked at sometime in fiscal year 23, we will be coming to you with recommendations for changing some things. You've probably heard through the uh, state of Florida that by 2026, the minimum wage has to be $15 an hour. Does not currently impact us for this budget year. We, we are, are good with everybody at that $15 an hour. However, by 2026, we may not have everything caught up to get to that 15. So we have asked as part of our scope of work in the paying class was for them to address that in our compensation strategy. So that will be addressed as part of that. I would imagine that Mr. McKenzie will talk more about cybersecurity, so I won't steal his thunder, but there are some things coming down through cybersecurity that will require more training and some things that require onboarding for staff that weren't a requirement previously, but I'll let him speak to that more. We are currently working on an offboarding policy and procedure. Um, this is something that's been on our radar for a long time that didn't exist, but it also is something that the Auditor General has brought forward as something that we should incorporate. So it is something that my staff is currently working on and um, we should hopefully have that done in the coming months. Lastly, not something that's a concern right now, but you know it's the state and they'll bring it up again. Somebody will bring forward, I'm sure, another bill related to the statutory limits that we have as a municipal government. Now we get into the fund numbers. So the general overview, you'll see about a 7% 7.7% increase in the human resources and in insurance services about a 4.5% decrease. And I'll talk to that more in the next slide. So for human resources, one of the things that we are proposing is the addition of a position. I have not asked for a new position and I don't think ever. Um, we are realizing how important training and development is. Uh, you all are aware that we implemented a tuition education reimbursement program very difficult to get out into the workforce and manage that program and get it to the best of its ability with the current staff. We also would like to do more than just the basic compliance trainings to just check a box and do more of the training and development that our staff need, which helps for retention as well. And we're proposing that um, be a cost split between HR and risk management because it covers both realms of our operation. We, the midpoint of that position at a grade N12 is about 73,000. You do see a decrease in our operating expenditures. That will be the increase in personnel other than the, the basics, but the personnel increase is mostly related to that training and development specialist. The decrease in operating is mostly due to the paying class study is in this current year's fiscal year budget. So obviously we're not proposing a new one for next year. 
Um, obviously, the paying class study wasn't just $35,000, so the slight difference in that increase is really an addition in the training budget. And then as far as risk management, so we'll start with COBRA. You do see an increase in COBRA solely has to do with the, what, what we call the great resignation. So that's just people leaving um, with less tenure than what they did before. And that's just common industry-wide. Retirees, I'm very excited to report that the operating expenditures have gone down 26%. Uh, that's mostly due to the continued trends of our prior plan modifications that we made. Also a decrease in the risk operating expenses, that's mostly due to training, which has reduced our workers' comp expenses, as well as our evaluations of insurance that we do annually to make sure that we keep those costs low. And then again, the personnel cost there is the training and development specialist. And that's all I have, unless there's questions. Good question. Yes, thank you. Um, the cost for your training, <laughs> Cost for your training and development specialist, 73,431. Does that include taxes and benefits? Yes, it does. Okay. It's the full cost burden of the position. Okay. And that's consistent throughout the presentation. That's correct. correct. Thank you. Can I piggyback off, off that? Um, who does our, I mean, I don't need a name. I don't want to call anyone out by name during any of these presentations, but we have one person that does our training now and we, we need, we need another. I don't have anybody that does the training now. It's, we, it's, it's pretty much me. Or we hire outsiders that actually conduct the training, but it's the administrative side of conducting that. So it's the scheduling, it's the finding the trainer, it's, all the work associated with the trainer just shows up in a room and expects it to be ready for them and, and set up and everything. So I just don't have the resources to be able to do as much as I would like because I don't have the staff to do it. And this person is going to have enough to do. I mean, a full time, we need a full time trainer in the, in the city to the tune of 73 grand. It sounds like a little bit of a, a stretch uh, to me. I mean, you said in your presentation that more training equals better retention. Um, I don't know if that's, uh, I mean, Mr. Vice Mayor, is that a, you're in HR, is that a, if you train better, do they stay longer? I would think if you give them more money, they stay longer. Money is a, is a short-term motivator. Mm -hmm. The long-term motivator is just the job you're in, the, mo you know, the, the morale, uh, the people you work for. Um, but also, I believe this position was only 75% HR and 25 percent risk management so it's budgeted 50 50 and so um 50 percent of what they would do would be the hr type trainings the other 50 percent would be right now we do safety trainings again it's being managed by multiple staff just to keep triage going to keep it going they would fully take over that responsibility which then would allow staff to open up to actually do more of the analytical things that we just don't have the time to do now so i mean that's the reality of why. Um, I could probably list whole three pages of different things that we would love to be able to give to a training and development specialist individual um, and standard throughout HR departments. They have an individualized person that, that handles all of that. That's kind of what I was gonna say. I was gonna say, I mean, I, I think this person needs a lot more to do than just training. I, I would. I'm not saying no, but I think this person needs a lot more responsibility than what was being presented in these pages. I could share with you if you need in the future. I have a draft job description, so I have no problem sharing that if that's something that you would like to see that does outline more of the responsibilities that would fall on them. Things like um, we have to track MVR, motor vehicle records, um, things that they have to have trainings related to that. So we would put on that person to do all the tracking and conduct the training so that it's all done timely. Right now we, we do it, but it's it's not as well done as it could be. We are in compliance and that's about the best I could say. Um, yeah, send that over to me, please. Will do. How much are you planning on spending on training this year? I believe we currently put in the budget $45,000 for training. Um, 
it's not currently earmarked for specific things. Obviously there is mandatory compliance training. I try and keep that to a minimal cost. Uh, the goal with that is to be able to offer some more of these additional trainings that um, what I would say is more about supervising, how to interact with people, um, customer service. I don't know if you all remember, we did Disney Institute training years ago for customer service and that was a huge hit. It's those types of things that I think our workforce could really benefit from, and we just don't have the time right now. Is that why some departments are so goofy? Could be, yeah. <laughs> I'm not looking at anybody in particular. But, um, well, I do have a question then, because last year you requested 40,000 for training. Now you're asking 45,000 for training plus 73,000 for a trainer. I would think that the training budget would go down if you're hiring a trainer for 73,000. They would take on some of the training that they can do themselves. What I will say is from an HR perspective is the message isn't always heard by the same person delivering the message. And so um, we all learn and we all learn differently from different people. And so sometimes it's better, you, you know, I might have one personality where I'm really good at doing this type of training. And, and then you ask me to go and do Disney Institute training and, and do all the warm fuzzy and that's not in my, um, skill set to be able to do. So sometimes, or they just don't have the knowledge. We did performance evaluation training. That's not something that usually somebody internal could do. It usually requires an external. I, I, that's fine, but I would think that that would go down instead of going up. So you kind of lost me on this position. I know that I know I don't really support this. Just I will say the reason 40,000 last year without one, and you want 45,000 to do it this year and another 73,000 to do it. You've lost me on that. It should go down. I expect 20,000 or something in that range. I don't want to hold up the whole process over 20 grand, but the request doesn't make sense to me. I guess what I would say is, is that the increase in the budget is the ability to schedule and add additional trainings that we can't do right now because we don't have the resources. I believe 10 or 15,000 of our current budget was actually used specifically or was earmarked specifically for executive leadership training, um, not necessarily for the entire workforce. It, it seems to me that um, that our different departments, I, I think, are conservative uh, economically when it, when they're looking at you know what they need to do and and the job that needs to be done. But it's glaringly obvious that a lot of our problems no matter where it is, is because we there is a lack of personnel. And when you don't have the people to do the job, that means the existing system is going to suffer simply because it cannot function at the level that it needs to or, it, or the level that it was designed to. And so to me, when there's a request, <clears throat> I think that the office of the city manager is taking these things serious. And, um, you know, and if we don't approve these things, we have to ask ourselves then what is the net result? Can they get the job done? Well, I guess they could, but it's not going to function at the level that it should, where there should be an ease administratively. Uh, and when they look at what it is that they need to accomplish administratively, they also look at personnel. How many people do they need in a certain department? And so let's just say we don't give this position. There is no way that it can get any better. There can be legitimate questions asked where, and I have some sympathy with what you're saying uh, about one versus the other, you know, should in a particular uh, category, the cost go down, maybe it should. But the bottom line is, is that I think that we're dealing with an administration that is aware of what it is that they need to do, um, you know, uh, monetarily, and they're conservative. And so, you know, like this $73,000, I'm sure that we have the people in place to make sure that whatever we pay anybody, that we're going to, you know, um, get the job done. And if we don't, because of the evaluation system that we have in place, then maybe we need to have some changes. But I don't see I don't see how we're going to get any better until we get people. We need people 
and they just said it's hard to get people. Nobody wants the job. And if nobody is working, how in the heck are we going to get the job done? That's just how I look at it. No, that's a good point. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Mr. McKenzie to present the, the Department of Quest for Information Technologies. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioner, uh, those listening. Ron McKenzie, Chief Information Officer. Some of our recent achievements. We obtained software for vulnerability scanning, a software called Nessus. We obtained software which, remote, which uh, uh, remotely pushes critical updates. So as critical updates come in, we're now able to push it. We didn't have that before. We implemented multi-factor authentication for critical applications. So we, we proposed that last year and we've been moving forward with all types of applications to make sure that we uh, move forward with multi-factor authentication, something that you have, something that you know. We upgraded the existing systems that we have that we use for ERP. We upgraded one solution to the new finance enterprise and that also we increased recording cap reporting capabilities with new Cognos reporting. We also upgraded Navalon. We implemented electronic pay stubs. You're all familiar with that. And we implemented a Deerfield Electronic Entered Permit System. We call it DEEPS. It's an application which allows, uh, which helps out the building department. So as people come in for building permits, it takes human error out of it and allows all the addresses to simply come up. Next slide. Some of the current initiatives that we're working on. We're working on policies and procedures for compliance with HB 7055. It's the cybersecurity bill, uh, which is the new directive from the state. We're centralizing all city facilities on a vigilant access control. We're completing the technology portion for Fire Station 51 and Fire Station 111. We're researching phone systems to replace our existing phone system. We're helping to roll out Laserfish to HR and active aging. Uh, Stephanie, the CFO, already spoke to us about, we spoke about the electronic notice for business tax renewals. We're working with that one so that way you can send out electronic notices and you click on the link to pay online. Our GIS department is working on utilities, network data migration. Uh, now, as it comes to different things dealing with um, uh, that particular type of thing, uh, we're working together in a joint situation as opposed to working individually. So we've got to do that. And then field data capture, that's also another thing that GIS is working on for parks application. It's something that we build that allows them to gather their resources and be able to see what they're, what's out in the parks. Future considerations. As I mentioned, HB 7055 cybersecurity bill compliance. It's a new bill that came out from the state that actually goes into effect July the 1st of this year, 2022. Some of the things that it mandates, it mandates that uh, we do not pay ransomware. Ransomware is not allowed anymore, so you can't pay ransomware. And so that uh, when it comes to that, there are some additions that we have to have to make sure we're safeguarded. So uh, as you notice, when the city manager first started to talk about CIP project, he talked about a backup uh, that we have that we are asked for for IT. I'll tell you a little bit about that particular backup, and, and I'm not going to talk too long today, but I'm not going to keep it too long. <laughs> but um, the way that things used to work as it comes to ransomware, remember, they would usually scramble your gear and say it had the key. So you'd have to pay for the key. Once you got that key, if you paid for it, it would, un, you know, you would get the key and it would open up and you'd be able to scramble. So they told people, okay, listen, make sure you have backups and have various versions of backups. And if you have various versions of backups, you're good. Well, the threat agent said, okay, listen, I'm still going to encrypt your data, but now I'm also going to steal your data. So now it's not just the fact that I have it. So even if you have data that you can put back, I now have it. So now they say, I'm going to release a little bit of this. So I'm going to release a little bit of this. So it's not just the key. It's the data that they have, and that's what they're able to do. So you still have to pay them. The new backup systems allows you to encrypt from end to end. So now if we encrypt the data, even if they steal it, it makes no sense to them. They, they're not able to decipher from it. The only people that have the key is us. So that's the new systems that we have. So I'm hoping that you approve that. So that just let you know about it. Some of the other things is training, as Amanda talked about. Everyone has to be trained once they come here within 30 days. IT training has to happen for IT staff. Uh, more frequently. Uh, so there's various different components. Uh, and actually, the city manager, myself, and um, Anthony uh, spoke this week about our plans for that to come up with policies, et cetera. So that's a major thing from the state. But there's also funding coming down from the state. Create. Oh. 
Creating a zero trust atmosphere for remote applications, it's a different way to do VPN. Workforce mobility and preparation for disasters, we wanna make sure that if anything comes up, we're making sure everybody's more mobile. Partnership collaborations for geospatial data. Continuous, our pay, continuing uh, continuation of our paperless culture shift. We've been trying to shift everything to make it more electronic and we'll continue on that. And um, prices, something that's a major note, prices of IT related things have increased and there is a much longer delay in terms of delivery. So uh, you've heard about it on the news, it also affects us. Thank you. As it goes to the numbers, uh, overall, there's an increase, a change of 37.2% in the IT budget, but a lot of that is due to allocation and capital projects. Here's some of the differences. The first thing, telephone charges are now added to the ITS budget this year before it was a, a general, not a general fund, but a- Non-departmental. Correct non-departmental fund and now it's been added to IT. Um, as far as increases, network communications, i.e. Comcast has gone up and that's increased about $38,386. Uh, software maintenance for the various software that we have and professional services for the professionals that we need sometime to help us with that software has increased $30,000 each. Other minor increases have gone to uh, inflation. As far as capital outlay, I spoke about the uh, backup. It gives me challenge, so I'm gonna read it from here, part in a second. spoke about the backup. Um, we also have some other things uh, as far as upgrading uh, the SIM, which is uh, something that allows us to look at various different reports as it goes, automatic uh, attack server, which allows us to simulate attacks to make sure that we're staying safe uh, before the threat comes in and then other things like that. That's it, questions? I have a question. Um, yes, sir. Whose budget is the ERP system coming out of? The ERP is in the general fund capital improvement program, so it's the capital fund. Okay, so it's not coming out of either one of these departments. Correct. All right. So, again, you know, Stephanie got the brunt of my frustration with the ERP system, but I think based on, and I'm looking right at last year's uh, future considerations, procurement and implementing of the ERP system, when we see those things, I don't think we look at the future being a couple of years down the road. In my opinion, this should have happened already. You've already heard me say it. Stephanie, you caught the brunt of it. Ron, this falls on you as well in this department. So that, that's what I feel. So, so this needs to be picked up. Uh, it's the same message I had before. The ERP system cannot lag like it's been doing. It needs to move forward. I remember um, a few years back, I was just looking at the evening news uh, locally, and they talked about, um, I think it was Rivera Beach, uh, they had been hacked and um, their inform and data stolen. And it was like, uh, I want to say five million, something like that they had to pay to get it back. And that hasn't happened in the city of Deerfield Beach. So, you know, I, I just want to just say that our IT department you know, um, is one that I have total trust in. I think you're doing a good job with, with what you're doing, uh, keeping us safe. Um, and this comes with considerations. I think in each and every one of our departments, there should be um, scrutiny. And as the, as, the, as, as Mayor Gann said, um, you know, some of these things need, need attention and they do. But, but I will tell you, in our IT department, this is one that we need to really pay attention to. And I think it's one that is easily taken for granted because nothing has happened. And, um, but nothing has happened for a reason. And the reason is that we have very competent people in place making very sound decisions that, that are affecting how we do business overall. Could you imagine? If something goes wrong with the IT, it's going to affect every department, and it's actually going to push us in a in a in a situation where there's an inability to be able to do our job. So, you know, um, I'm happy, and 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 uh, I, you know, however we can help you to continue to do a good job um, to keep us safe, uh, you know, I'm on board for that because it's important, it's important. I hear it all the time, people getting hacked and whatever. Why, 
has that not, not, not that I'm asking for it to happen in Deerfield, but it hasn't. It hasn't happened for a reason, a good reason. Thank you. I'm going to, I want you to talk to me briefly about the general fund because it's an increase of 37% to, from 2.6 million to 3.5 million. And even if I were to include the capital outlay of 431,000, the telephone of 180,000, the network communications of 38,000 and software maintenance and professional services of 30,000 each, it still gets me about a quarter million short of that nine, uh, that 3.55 million. So uh, the change is 970,000. I get roughly um, 709,000. And, and the only reason I'm nitpicking this is much, it's probably something I should have said at the very beginning is because I'm extremely concerned about the results of this pay and class study that are going to come out. That's going to add millions to our budget, um, millions. And so I'm very proud that we've been able to maintain um the millage rate in fact since i've come in office in 2017 it's actually gone down um albeit slightly but it's gone down and we've been able to maintain that millage rate all of these all of these years and and i understand we run a, a lean budget here and there's a reason that we that we do that but in order to continue to maintain that millage rate i mean we're getting hammered um you know on these dso contracts um and, and this pay in class just scares the living daylights out of me because it's going to add a lot of millions, uh, in my opinion. But we have to to retain the talent because otherwise, look, look at the otherwise we get what we have right now, a uh, hundred empty positions. So we have to stay competitive with our with our sister cities, or it's going to really be a bad situation for it. So I know we have to keep up with the Joneses, um, but we owe a fiscal stewardship to the residents uh, that are paying these taxes as well. And that's a very delicate balance and a fine needle. To thread year from year. So the reason I point all this out is if there's 250,000 discrepancy here, that 250,000, you know, this year may be fine, but next year when we come into these other strains that we're going to have on our on our budget, and who knows where inflation is is going, this could just be the tip of the iceberg. So between inflation um, and the pay in class study, and there's also increases in other fees. Um, I'm not so concerned for this year, but I'm very wary going forward what future budgets would look like. So, you know, 250,000 here, 250,000 there could be the difference on what a future budget looks like. So that's why I, I bring it up with respect to, I'm just, you happen to get the, you know, you happen to get me picking it out on this one, but you know, there's like a quarter million dollars difference there. So if, if just be careful to every budget director, you know, what we're requesting going forward, because these differences are going to make big differences in future budgets going forward, in my opinion. If I may, Commissioner, I 100% agree with you. Um, just bear in mind, this is not a presentation of the final budget. I um, And I realize I, I'm I, not asking him to break it down penny by penny tonight, but I'm, the, the bigger point was if there's 250,000 savings somewhere as you craft a budget for us later, this may be an area I didn't point out. I didn't want Mr. McKenzie to tell me what it was because I understand what the purpose of tonight is. Uh, but I'm just trying to say, as we as we cobble this together, um, look for savings where we can. It gets to the point where we're where I'm looking for dollars. You know, when it gets down to it, so we are far from a balanced budget. Um, these are the department level requests, and with all respect to the department directors it's like Christmas. You know, they can ask for everything that they want. They you can't always get it. Right. And so that's, that's where I actually told them today um, that, you know, once we get through this and get into July and we have more solid revenue figures, that's where we'll be putting together a more uh, structured budget for consideration by the city commission. And, the largest portion comes from capital projects, which is on my capital outlay, if you look on there. And much of that may come from the cybersecurity bill. In addition to it being a bill because it's mandated, there are some dollars that are coming down also. But we had to allocate and let it be known that these are things that we need in order to be in compliance. And so that's why some of these things are here. That's why that's, you see, the biggest difference uh, on there. That's that's the huge difference, like 450,000 or whatever. It's okay. actually 200,000, but, uh, and, Commissioner Drosky obviously looked at my notes 
um, because that's exactly what I was going to point out, is, is when you add up the 180, the 40, the 30, the 431, you come up with about 2779, and your budget is increasing by, by 970. Um, so there is almost $200,000 that is, is not being reflected. Uh, and, and so I was curious about that because as, as Commissioner Drosky accurately pointed out, we're seeing a lot of increases just the other night with regards to, to these um, lifeguard stations. They went from 170 to, to 221 in, in six months. And, and even though as you know, city uh, manager pointed out, our revenues are increases, but they're being sucked up by the increase in labor costs, the increase in software costs, the increase in, in, in capital expenditures costs. So we really do have to make sure we, you know, we sharpen our pencils um, because it looks great right now, but it, it's going to catch up to us really quick. And this, this capital, uh, the, the, this study, this class study is going to open a lot of eyes and, and I'm equally concerned about that because uh, again, employee retention, it's not just training. There's, there's a lot that goes into employee retention and um, a part of it is wages. And it is extremely difficult in finding people as, as all of our department members know, um, you know, half the 95% of the people want to work from home right now. Uh, you know, we saw that the unemployment in Deerfield Beach is 2.5%. So that tells you that anybody who wants to work, full employment is 3%. So anybody who wants to get a job can get a job. Those 2.5% are the people who really aren't looking for a job, even though they're capable of working. So it's, it's very important uh, that we sharpen our pencils and make sure that, that we're doing the right thing and spend at the right spot. Thank you. Gilliard, you're going to have to come over to the table for this one. Thank you. And then next to our presentation, the budget for the city clerk's office. We'll uh, take a look at the AC. Thank you. Kick it up a couple notches. Good evening. I um, wanted to start out discussing some of our. Name that just for record, please. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Wanted to start out by discussing some of our achievements for this fiscal year. First, with the public records, we've made changes to the training structure. Not only are state statutes and lawsuits addressed during that training, but the utilization of public records software, just FOIA, have been integrated. So there's a clear understanding of what electronic file will include. We've also updated the city's policy for added measures against discrepancies with requests. Next, due to staff training and additional help from the assistant city clerk and record specialist, we reduced the number of packages outsourced for ADA remediation. Staff has also tackled the remediation of online campaign treasury reports for elected officials dating back to 2009 for incumbents. And lastly, we've made significant strides with our website by removing redundant pages, fixing broken links, which connects the user to a form, document, or other outside entity along with the remediation of various forms and documents throughout the website. Next. Current initiatives. The plan is to create a brief, informative video and share with field and office personnel not required to attend the training as to how to properly handle a public record request when they are, if they are addressed in the field or in, in the lobby at City Hall or at um, Central City Campus. The advisory board members and handbook. These two initiatives work hand in hand because the board members will now have an opportunity to review an online video 
or read the handbook to learn more about requirements of the board before applying. Remediation of forms and documents to ensure the website maintains consistency. An internal policy will be created to help new employees understand the importance of remediation and provide a timeline for reviewing their web pages. So obsolete forms are removed and ADA compliance is continued. The major thing here with the November referendum and March municipal elections, um, we do have the question that is going on the November ballot for the term limits that is already underway and all of the deadlines for the SOE have been met. The cost estimates will be addressed shortly as well as the possible changes to the March 2023 municipal election. Regarding the audio visual updates to the commission chambers, the plan is to add new equipment to enhance the experience for both in person and virtual attendees. I know a lot of times we have people that say that they can't hear, whether it be on Zoom or whether it's inside the chambers. So hopefully these new changes will, will address all that. Future considerations. We want to begin by synchronizing our lobbyist registration system with the online registration form. And basically what that would entail, it would allow staff to better manage registration and ensure that payments and forms are received and complete. So right now we are using a paper system. Everything has to be filled out and mailed to us and notarized along with the check. If we are able to go ahead with our next consideration, which is implement a, a pay online system for public records and for lobbyists, it's going to reduce our need for, well, our receipt of paper checks, as well as our foot traffic into City Hall. And there's always a concern, you know, with, with going to the post office, is your check going to make it to the person it's supposed to make it to? So that that's always a consideration. And then we also, people have to come in to pay by credit card. So to, for me, for everyone involved, cashiers and the clerk's office and the requester, it would be much a, a better opportunity to have them pay online instead of having to come. And also waiting for people to come in, it reduces the time that, that they are able to access the records. And lastly, we do have a plan to create, well, this is, this is kind of interesting. So we recently had an issue with um, an advisory board in their minutes. So what we did is we actually did a, a quick tutorial to help them, you know, better manage how to transcribe minutes. So the plan going forward is to create just a small tutorial and provide online training at their request. Next. Now for the operating budget, there was a slight decrease, as you can see with the operating expenditures, um, reducing it by 2.6%. That is mainly in part due to staff training for ADA remediation. We were able to reduce the contractual services with Crawford and the training that we provide to the staff, it is, it, it's essentially a training that helps them to, to stay current with their skills. And we also do it for brand new employees as well. Along with that, we have in my office, the assistant city clerk and the record specialist who work together to make sure that any documents on the agenda that have not been remediated by the staff is done so in our office instead of sending it out. Now, the main increase that you'll see is due to the budget in the election. We are planning to, to spend probably right around the 150,000 for the municipal election. The referendum for November is definitely set at a little bit less than 35,000. But if we include the question regarding the property disposition for the property on 11th way, if that goes on the ballot, it basically opens up the entire city for an election. So right now, the cost for the election for just districts one and two is 66,100. If we add the question, it opens it up to the entire city. The new SOE has formulated a calculation. 
So we will we will be paying a lot more than the people who are participating, the cities participating in the November, November election. The cost is 279 per registered voter. So it doesn't matter how many people come out. The 10% that we normally get to come out, it doesn't matter. It's based on, we have 49,000, a little bit more than 49,000 registered voters in the city. So at 279 per person, per registered voter, we're looking at $150,000 just for just for March to add a question. Now, what I have been told, if we do add multiple questions, that cost doesn't change. I don't buy that, but that's what I've been told. <laughs> and that is it for me. If you have any questions, I'm ready to answer. Thank you. I have You're one welcome. question. When it comes to electronic payment portal, is that software that needs to be purchased? So currently, our finance department does have a system, and what I wanted to do was to collaborate with them so that we don't have multiple systems doing the same thing. Okay. okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? No. Thank you. Excellent job. Thank you. Next, we have our public affairs and marketing. Good evening, Mr. Dean. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, I'm Rebecca Medina Stewart, and uh, I'm with the Public Affairs and Marketing Office. Um, uh, and real quick, too, my team is here: David Hunt, our Communications Manager; Phil Bullock, our new Multimedia Production Specialist, and everyone knows Janine uh, Penoyer, the Coordinator, uh, Marketing Coordinator. Um, so I'll jump right in to our recent achievements. Um, this year so far, we've already met and surpassed uh, the goal that we set last fiscal year for 11,000 followers to hit that 11,000 mark on, on Instagram. And as you might remember, that was important for us because we are tapping into a demographic uh, that we haven't really been able to reach. Uh, through Facebook and other social media platforms, 60% uh, of, the, of the users for Instagram are between 18 and 34 years old. Uh, so, so sort of attracting, have, being able to attract that demographic is important for us. Um, and uh, next we have, uh, this year so far, we've hit uh, 43,000 subscribers on YouTube, uh, 4 million views on YouTube. Um, this year, I do expect that we will probably have fewer views on YouTube, uh, particularly because of the pandemic. Our numbers were through the roof those two years, but now that people are back to work, uh, you know, people have been told to shut their TVs off. So, um, so we have we. I do expect that we will come under. Uh, I, I think it was eight million we had last year. Um, but uh, I do expect that we will probably hit about 6 million views this year. Um, this year, uh, Pam also won two gold video awards, one for the RIP Current uh, PSA, a public service announcement, and the other for the Memorial Day coverage during uh, the pandemic. Um, we also received an Emmy nomination for the Memorial Day coverage. Um, and props, of course, to our photographer, videographer team. Um, we completed the website and mobile app redesign. Uh, and in the midst of this design, uh, which took it, this was a year long, probably just over a year long project. Um, and it, we went, just to put some perspective on this project, we went from 2,500 pages on that website dating back to 2004. Uh, to what we have currently, which is about 450 pages on the website. Um, and, and that was uh, a, a very lengthy process for Janine. Uh, she essentially took on the hat, an additional hat of webmaster during that year. Um, we created policy and a training curriculum for content creators uh, for this new website. Uh, because what we realized was that in order for us to keep the site clean and ADA, truly ADA compliant, uh, there needs to be regular monitoring of the site, uh, its documents, and the image repositories. 
Uh, so far, uh, we've seen more than 1.1 million visits to our city website, uh, 230 more than two, just more than uh, just over 237,000 of those visits are in search of the live cameras uh, pages that we have or the live camera social media pages that we have. Um, and this year, we also collaborated with the CRA on new signage at the pier. Uh, the artwork of the different fish found in our area are now uh, plastered all over the pier uh, in beautiful color. Um, we've designed new artwork for the meters using the branding that Pam created specifically for the beach. Um, we went from a regular daily notification system to, to a city newsletter uh, that goes out two to three times a week. And this shift for us has actually worked really well. We've seen uh, our, our open rate in this email blast essentially shift and, and actually surpass uh, the national standard. The national standard on, on open rate right now for email blasts is about 35%. Um, and we're, we're trending over 40% right now. Uh, the, the last uh, newsletter that went out ad advertising and marketing this workshop uh, had a 44% open rate. Um, so it's doing quite well. Um, we also have two new live stream cameras that have been added at the beach to capture the surf conditions for the surf culture here in Deerfield Beach, as well as uh, the sport cam uh, to capture the volleyball, football tournaments and, and all of the sports over on the sand. Uh, this is something that, as many of you well know, the YouTube community has been asking for for a while. And after many months of testing, we finally went live with the sport cam on Friday, the June 10th. And just this Monday, uh, we went live with the surf cam and already we've, we've received great feedback from the community on those. Uh, next slide. And this is just a very, just a visual representation of some of the things that we've worked on uh, this year, especially some of the signage that you guys have seen out on the pier. Next slide. Um, some of, our, some of the initiatives that we currently have in process right now, you heard me mention the cameras at the beach, which is part of the Naturescapes initiative. Um, that's, that's the first phase of the Naturescapes initiative and, and that's just been completed. Uh, we, we are hoping to be testing the bee apiary camera uh, before the end of this fiscal year. And I am working, our department is working with the sustainability coordinator on that camera or on that camera project rather. Um, thanks to the additional help that we've received in public affairs and marketing, uh, we've been able to step up our video presence. So thank you to the commission, because we were talking about this uh, this time last year. Um, and that extra help has been super beneficial to us, uh, especially with, with promotional material and, and PSAs. Uh, we've done a lot of fun stuff for the public. Um, but the thing that we're really excited about launching and uh, this, this fiscal year, and we're, we are working on it right now, uh, is something called the Deer Resident Spotlight. And um, this, is, this is something, this is going to be a feature uh, of ordinary residents doing extraordinary things in our community. And um, we are already working on our first story for that, and we hope to have that launched really soon. Um, but that's going to be something that features and spotlights residents and, and people in this community. Um, we also collaborated with Human Resources to implement uh, the employee spotlight on social media. That is currently running right now. We've gotten some really great feedback on that from the community as well. Uh, and we're hoping to grow that next year, maybe add some video components to that. Uh, the fish page on the website continues to grow. This is an ongoing initiative. Uh, a collaborative initiative with the community, with particularly YouTube fish fans uh, from Deerfield Beach to the UK. Uh, and they help us grow that, that project every year. Um, and that's morphed into a pretty cool educational tool as well. Uh, it's pretty popular on the website. Um, we've also redesigned the city flag uh, this year, and that is set to go before all of you uh, on June 21st for your final approval. Uh, we created a Juneteenth promotional and educational uh, video this year, uh, something that was actually really well done and just took us a, a long time to get done. We worked hard on it, but it, it's a beautiful piece. 
and that is currently running. It's received more than more than 2,500 views uh, on social media so far. Um, we are also working with Parks to produce a video about the past, present, and future of Ovita McKeithen Recreational Complex for the purposes of um, hopefully obtaining and winning some grant funds for the future Westside Pavilion. Um, we are also working on a, a couple of new designs for merchandise uh, over at the Bay Tackle and Souvenir Shop. This year we did really well with the designs uh, that were created at the beginning of the year and they've sold, they continue to sell out at the bait shop. So we're having a lot of success with those. We're real happy with those. Um, we also expect to begin replacing um, the current housing of the underwater camera with the new UV technology. Uh, and we that's that should be done around uh, sometime in August, hopefully the, the first couple of weeks of August, we hope to begin that project. Um, we're hoping that that new UV technology that I talked a little bit about this time last year uh, will help to slow the growth of the of the barnacles and just the gook that's getting on that camera uh, very often. Um, if we'll be testing that UV technology for the next six to 12 months. Um, and if it works, fingers crossed, it will mean that we will it will mean less dives for my team, essentially. We won't have to be in the water as often cleaning that up. Fewer phone calls and emails and all the stuff that we love. Um, some upcoming initiatives and future considerations. Uh, you've heard me talk about nature skates. Uh, I mentioned the, the B apiary camera in the last slide. We do expect this fiscal year to, uh, be, to begin installing and testing the Arboretum nature cameras. Um, and that's, they'll be essentially capturing uh, the sound and the sights of the waterfalls out there, uh, as well as uh, some, some birds in, in the banyan tree. We've got some plans for, for a bird feeder up there and to be able to stream some, some nature out of Deerfield Beach. Um, we also uh, are hoping to update firewall, the firewalls for our, our first phase of, uh, for the first phase of our cameras that have been implemented so far. Uh, we're expecting to see uh, continued advances in social media and other communications tools. And one of the tools that we've added to our budget for your consideration this year is something called CityBot. Um, and the CityBot is essentially a texting communications tool for the public. Um, it, would, it would essentially be just an additional tool to the arsenal of tools that we have right now for communications. Um, instead of an email blast, it's a text blast, essentially. Uh, residents will have to opt in and sign up for that, just like they do for email. Uh, but that is something that is up for your consideration this, this next fiscal year. Uh, online platforms have become uh, about much more than just posting and sharing. Um, people are shopping, gaming, and as you all well know now, with uh, live streaming on social media, that's the thing. Uh, algorithms are continuing to improve and the data and analytics are getting better. Uh, platforms are getting more sophisticated and complex, especially the back end business pages of those platforms, um, which is uh, which leads me to my next point, which is uh, continued education. Um, to help you better understand what I'm talking about, Facebook right now is a platform that we've been working on for a long time. Um, and they changed their their business page platform, which is what we have. Uh, almost every year to two years. It's, it's, and it's gotten worse over the years and it's become much more complicated to use. Currently we're on the meta suite, which is what we've had to transition to. And, and it's, it continues to get more and more complicated and complex. So I do think that um, just continued education and training in the platforms and how they're developing uh, is going to be something that we're is going to be necessary for us, um, and just to make sure that we're tapping into the full functionality uh, of our platforms. Uh, continued upgrades to the underwater equipment technology is something that we're going to have to continue to take a look at in the coming years. Um, we're we're already seeing the effects of climate change uh, in, with the underwater camera. Um, when we first put the underwater camera in about eight years ago now, um, we were diving maybe every two to three months to clean that. Uh, right now, my team 
is diving probably every three to four weeks to clean that um, because the growth is just uncontrollable. Um, it's, it, it's the barnacles and the gook on that camera is growing faster and faster. So um, just taking a look at, at future technology. And there are a lot of things happening right now with underwater camera technology that we can uh, start to research and look, look into. Um, and then finally, um, marine tracking technology is definitely something that we should think about incorporating with the underwater camera. Um, this is something that is probably going to be a bigger conversation once the sawgrass to seagrass uh, project gets gets started with with Guy Harvey. There's going to be a lot of uh, tracking technology tools that we can probably look into along with their team, as well as other innovative video online and live stream and live stream opportunities. The main changes to my operating budget were a decrease in, in personnel services, uh, but that's actually augmented by contractual services. Uh, and then the other change was the $31,000 in capital outlay for additional live stream cameras and to complete the Naturescapes initiative next fiscal year. I think that's it. Any questions? I don't know if everyone is um, aware of how important uh, this department is, uh, affairs and marketing. Um, I was up in Juneau Beach. Uh, this was during uh, snook season. And there was a rather large group of fishermen that were talking. And here's what they said. This is uh, that they had saw there was a large amount of snook uh, in Deerfield Beach. So we're going to go down to Deerfield Beach. We'll eat over um, at the burger place. Uh, we'll get, we can get our ice from down the road. And I'm just listening to this. And, they, and the one guy was talking about uh, the, you know, uh, weights that were available. Well, they have the, those over in their fish, um, in, in the fish house there. So I was looking at that. Here's a group of people coming down to Deerfield, bottom line, to spend money. And so, and they saw that, and that was all initiated from them looking at our underwater cameras. It, it is actually yielding more than what's being said here tonight. That's for sure. Um, um, and the we're going to be looking at the redesign of the uh, of the city flag. I would just ask my colleagues to consider that in every park in the city of Deerfield Beach, it should be, a, we should have the American flag and our city flag. American flag and our city flag in every park, and that's not the case right now. And so I would hope that uh, it's something that you guys would consider. I don't know if anybody here has seen the Juneteenth promo, but it is awesome. What a good job. What a good job. It's a good promo. Thank you. And uh, I really appreciate it. Me, you know, in our marketing department, it's what they do. I mean, what, this, this is what other people are looking at. So it's actually bringing revenue to the city of Deerfield Beach uh, because there are a lot of avid fishermen uh, coming from Miami as well as people up north and all looking at our underwater camera. And that's huge. So we need to keep this going. We need to promote this. This is something that is very advantageous to our city, uh, but not because it looks good. Uh, it does because I've seen it, but because it's bringing money into the uh, into our city, people are spending money here because of that cam. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And to your point, we have seen to this year, we've re we're receiving more and more email from people as far away as Canada and Wisconsin and New Hampshire, uh, people who are coming down to visit Absolutely. Deerfield Beach because of what they've seen, not just on the underwater camera, but on the beach cameras. Um, we, have, we have received email after email from people who say that they've come here, that they've stayed here. Uh, and we're actually, one of the projects that we have, that we have ready to go is uh, probably a, a promotional project about some of that tourism effect. Awesome. Yeah. Any other questions?
Um, one of the things I actually made a, a list. This is my priority list for all the departments this year. And on my list was uh, text notifications, uh, which is covered by your city bot texting. And as I was looking, as my colleagues were speaking, one of the one of the main features of it is alerts that we can send to residents, which I think is super critical, um, especially as it comes to uh, hurricane season or any other uh, messaging that we want to get out to the city. I don't think email is um, sufficient. Email, I think, is becoming antiquated. And although I'm, you know, hesitant about overusing it because you don't want to overwhelm people with text messages, but I think this could be a very valuable um, service. Um, one of the other components to it says it can residents can get immediate answers to questions, make service requests, send personalized messages, and get real time alerts. I'm obviously extremely interested in the real time alerts. Were you contemplating any of those other services um, by this texting communication? Yes. Um, what 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 the main use for that would be is really to just re, re, uh, reminders of city meetings, reminders of city workshops. Uh, city events. Uh, the alert notification portion of it is something that we would not utilize simply because we have a system already that we that we use through the state. Uh, it's an emergent an emergency alert system and it's a callback system. Uh, it's a call texting email system that goes out to residents in cases of any crisis. And our residents, we've, we've, we have about 125,000 people signed up to that. And that right now, our residents know when they get a call from Alert DFB that something's going down. And it's something that we don't use often, but when we do use it, it's, it's well received. We get a, a big click rate on that, and it, it does really well. Um, but in, in, in some communities, we've, re, we've received some uh, complaints of, of issues with communication for those individuals who don't utilize social media or don't utilize email or don't don't uh, you know log on to the city website and so this would be just an additional tool to notify uh, our residents particularly senior residents um, of, of things that are happening in the city and during crisis moments we would it would be something that we would send out um, other type of notification on things like sandbag collection uh, would go out and. I mean, I'd be in favor of it now, but it has to have that alert communication to it. I mean, as pleasant it is listening to your voice to the alert DFB messages I get, um, there has to be a more immediate uh, component to it. No one, a lot of people aren't, maybe you're not going to listen to that 30 second minute message that. You look at your phone. I mean, if, if anyone is like me, you're constantly on the go and you're looking at your, your phone. And so um, I, I think there's a benefit to, to that. So if, if, if you're going to include the alert messaging, uh, I'm all for it uh, for this year, because I think we need to. One we of the can core, include whatever you want in that. One of the core <laughs> functions of government is to um, is safety, public safety. That's what we do. That's one of the main things yes. that we should do in any way that we can communicate with our residents. Um, uh, to me, was any additional ways that we can communicate with our residents, I think is a good thing. So not everybody has email um, or a landline anymore, but everybody has a cell phone. And so I think that would be an additional way that we can we can communicate. So that was on my list of priorities. If you include the alert um, system, I'm, and what's the, do we have a estimate? I guess I should ask, I'm going to pull a Parnes here, but what's the estimated carnet, uh, cost to that system? Uh, that's going to be about 15000 and it's for like the baseline service. Okay. All right, so put me in as a yes for that. Thank you. Can we get some clarity from the board as it was directed to the city manager regarding flag placement? The parks will be on board. Oh, without a flag. doubt. If I, if I may research what costs and effort would be related to that, because it's not just raising a flag. You've, you've got to engineer the flagpoles to be placed uh, to certain standards. Uh, it's not like placing a residential flag where you get the ability to just go to Home Depot and you know, get one of those aluminum flagpoles. It, it's a substantial, um, so, so we have to, I'd like to just check which flagpoles we have out there uh, because I believe also if you have, if you wanna do the city flag, I think it's all, all, also customary 
to do not only the the state flag. State flag. right you got to do the state flag too so in some cases i might need to engineer two engineer and construct two additional flagpoles just to put the city flag up as well so i need to if i could just look at some options and and, I, and maybe you know i don't know let me just uh check check what i, I need I to do for the that parks, the parks where they exist now a lot of them were service organization projects mm -hmm. park over at the village of hillsborough park that flag there was an eagle scout one so all these lodges and groups and, and, and maybe they can get together and try to think to do that in the city I think that suggestion. Mm. Okay. Um, just one follow-up comment with Rebecca. Great job, of course, on the department. But as as we're talking about communicating, you know, sixty thirty percent of our of of our residents are seniors. They're not on the internet. They don't have cell phones. What are we doing to communicate to those individuals? How are we targeting those individuals? So I do have a contact over at Century Village right now, which is a site. We used to have a regular newspaper, right, exactly, a Let's local go. newspaper that used to cover specifically Deerfield Beach, and it was right. Deerfield Beach centric. We no longer have that. Right, Pompano Beach, or the I'm Pelican. sorry, the Pompano, the Pelican does a does an okay job of, it, but they have a, a slew of cities that they right. cover. Uh, so right now, the information that gets to them, a lot of communication, depending on how pertinent or urgent it is, um, we get a lot of that communication out through the phone bill. Uh, things are changing with policy. We try to get that on a phone bill so that they get it there. Sometimes we, we add flyers in the phone bill as well and things that are happening in the city. Um, but uh, I, I think texting is probably going to be our best bet to reach out to those individuals. At Century Village, which I was getting ready to say, they do put our information out uh, either in the reporter, which is their local paper there, or they put it up on their TVs on their local events and that okay. sort of thing. Do they have like a TV station? Some of those communities have like stations. Uh, it's not a where they could station, go but they do have a they have a production facility where they pump out. Century Village has its own channel. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. And and they they you can pump out information through that. Yeah, I know it's difficult. Mm -hmm. Okay. Going back to that, yeah. uh, you said 60 percent of the town planning. Is that something that the rest of the city can tap into as a resource? No. No. The city used to have its own channel. Uh, Comcast, though, changed some things in the last year and wanted to start charging for that. It used to be a free public service channel. It's no longer free. And they wanted to charge for it and add additional in order to, it's not just a charge. Of course, they'll do it. But not everybody has Comcast. Not everybody has Comcast. Right. Yeah, so it's a, it's a whole nother issue. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, and while we're waiting for the next victim to come up, um, <laughs> we, we talk about, Rebecca talked about open rates. I will say this, um, it, it, not to sound big brothery, but we do know who receives our emails. We do know when they open it and what time they open it. So when you hear people say, I never got the notification, we know when you're lying. Thank you. Next, I have Mr. Power to present the Planning and Development Services uh, budget request. Eric Power, victim number 43. I mean, uh, Director of Development Services. Uh, thank you. Sorry. Next. <laughs> Denied. Um, so in the recent achievements for Planning and Development Services, uh, we I'm pretty proud of a lot of things that we've accomplished in this, uh, what was a difficult year for everyone. Uh, we did complete the 2021 comprehensive plan. Um, the amendment that you approved did go to the state on May 2nd. They have a 60 day uh, window, which means we'll get it hopefully back by uh, early next month and that item will be completed. So that's that's exciting for us. We did two, two code, major code amendments this last year, sea turtle lighting, docks and seawalls. I will let you know that docks and seawalls will come back to the commission in August for a minor amendment as the county has made a policy change um, that we would also like to adopt. Um, of course, if you all remember the B Tactical uh, Third Avenue installation that we did for a, a grant that will help us in the future to do a um, complete streets along Third Avenue that was a wildly popular installation along the residents. We still receive compliments um, and we are in the, still in the process of tracking um, the improvements to that roadway. We saw a significant decrease in speed 
even though it's still not to the speed limit, it is a significant decrease in speed. And I would like to continue that program, which I'll discuss a little bit on, uh, later on. Uh, we did receive uh, certified local government um, um, certification from the state, which means that we're allowed to have the Historic Preservation Board. The, uh, the state uh, is required to provide training to board members. Currently, they're telling us that that training will occur sometime around October or November. Uh, we are allowed to meet prior to the training, but we're not allowed to uh, actually take action. So our goal is to begin the Historic Preservation Board later this summer with some visioning meetings where we'll have conversations with the board about what their goals are, and what the city goals are, and then hopefully we'll have trading uh, with the state later this, uh, this year, and then be able to begin um, our board uh, officially in, in the next calendar year. I, as you remember, as we just had the last meeting, we had the Arterial Median Landscape Manual approved, Dixie Highway Landscape Improvements. I know that uh, Mr. Santucci touched on this for a moment, uh, but you know the landscaping that occurred along Dixie Highway uh, for the fence and rail system that was approved, you know, that was an upgrade that we did that came from our Landscape Trust Fund. Um, working with finance and IT, and I believe they both mentioned in their reports, we did convert the business tax receipts to GovEasy. GovEasy is the online permitting process that the building department now uses. So it is now easier for applicants uh, to utilize uh, this process. They can pay for um, their permits on their credit card, or just as a quick example for it. Um, you're also required to receive what's called a certificate of use when you start a business in Deerfield Beach. If uh, in previous you had to apply for certificate of use through the GovEasy process, and you still had to go through a physical process with your BTR system. So trying to apply for two different processes that you're required to have as a business, and using two different softwares. So this is something that helps align those situations and it makes it easier uh, for us to send out those uh, annual reminders to renew the business tax receipts. Uh, and as finally, we did link um, Broward, I'm sorry, okay. Broward County e-permits, city building permits. And essentially what that means is that if you also have to apply for a Broward County permit in conjunction with your Deerfield Beach permit, you can actually do that at the Deerfield Beach building department at the same exact time. I'm sorry, thank you. Uh, current initiatives is, you know, we did um, uh, get a, um, a firm to help us with our Northwest Area Improvement Plan. We are in the process of phase one. We've had several meetings with the group. We are hoping to have a, our, our first public meeting in the Northwest Area sometime in the July timeframe. And of course, we just we talked about the Historic Preservation Board training. We would like to partner again with the FAU um, graduate students uh, this fall. They are looking at doing what's a, a walkability program. Uh, again, going back to the southern part of Deerfield Beach um, in, in the area that's around the, the Tedder and the Tallman Pines area, this is a, uh, a software program that they want to utilize that will help the city better understand the needs of people who primarily walk, bike, or use public transit as their primary means to, for, for moving around. So it'll give us um, better insight to what they need and then they have input that they can provide to the city. So I think it's another good program for us to work with them again on. Um, we are still moving towards online submittal for building permits. We have multiple uh, types of building permits for online submittal. We are at that stage still where we have to create the records retention process for us to be able to store documents in the correct manner. Um, we did expand our tree uh, landscape uh, preservation fund programs in multiple ways this past year. Uh, one of those is a second tree giveaway. So that tree giveaway will be going in October. What we're doing that's a little bit different about that tree giveaway is that we'll probably be rotating it around the city. Um, this, this coming October, it'll be at the Highlands Community Center, but we would look to rotate that in other areas besides where the main tree giveaway is. So it gives an opportunity for other people around the city who maybe don't take advantage of going up to Alvina McKeithen to, to get a tree. Um, and then, you know, uh, obviously um, this entire board is well aware of all the all the work that we're doing for 10th Street uh, regarding coordination meetings, aesthetic and architectural review. So speaking a little bit back to um, Third Avenue, uh, tactical urbanism is the planning tool that is utilized to uh, create temporary improvements to roadways and those temporary improvements that we made were things like paint and bollards and things like that 
What I'd like to be able to do in this next year's budget is to um, request $25,000 that will help us create a multi-year plan that will allow us to use similar methods of tactical urbanism throughout the city. And more specifically, looking at creating decorative crosswalks at our elementary schools, uh, our middle school, and a couple other areas that are really important for the city. And one of those areas in particular would be the crosswalk at 40th and 2nd Avenue, where the bridge that goes across 95 actually exits for the people who utilize um, Tedder Elementary. And that, that particular crosswalk, kids are leaving from that bridge and, and there's actually no crosswalk there. So there's, there's ways that we can improve the city's walkability in some of these manners. They are local streets. I would be targeting local streets um, so that we wouldn't have to deal with some of the issues we dealt with the Third Avenue and, and Broward um, MPO and Broward uh, Transit. Um, and I think this would be a nice program for the city. We would utilize volunteer work as we did before. We would um, you know, engage the community and things like that. So with that funding, it would essentially allow for us to create a multi-year plan to um, buy things like paints and materials and have community meetings and things like that. Uh, we will look at doing a, a phase two and possibly even a phase three for the Northwest Area Improvement Plan. So we're requesting some, some dollars for that. The county rezoning initiative in the annexation areas, that has not moved forward since 2019. The reason we originally did stop that particular process was because of COVID. The amount of in-person meetings that we need with the communities is extensive. Um, so we did stop doing that, or we did, I'm sorry, we stopped that program during the time of COVID. We would like to re-engage that program this next year. It's going to be important for the city to have multiple outreach meetings with residents of the southern parts of Deerfield Beach in order for us to create the annexation. Um, we will be making some changes to land use amendments that came directly from the comprehensive plan. I want to speak a little bit about some of the state statutes that have occurred this past year. Every year, the state of Florida makes it more difficult as a home rule um, for the cities to, to operate. Uh, in this particular year, uh, Senate Bill 620, which is a local business protection um uh, statute uh, essentially is another one of those statutes where a bill was passed in which there's very little to any um direction and we've had a lot of miscommunication between residents who believe that they can just do anything now at home uh this has happened in multiple situations uh where uh, multiple cities across the state where we've had these situations and uh, it's just gonna become a further problem for us um, initially, uh, one of the other uh, statutes that occurred, uh, House Bill 423, um, multiple conflicts with for the building code, FEMA, uh, regular ways in which uh, we operate as, uh, as a municipality, um, violations to uh, demolition permits that directly conflicts with, again, with like, you know, FEMA guidelines, and also allows for uh, private providers to uh, come forward into the city. And requires us to have what's called a, a reasonable administration administrative fee for private providers, um, which is a revenue loss, you know, for the city and also really a customer service loss for the city. And I think it's important that we show residents and businesses in the city that the city of Deerfield Beach and our building department and our planning and development services is the best value that they have and the opportunity that they have to create development in the city. Uh, and we will have to look again at reevaluating the building fee schedule for those reasons based on the state statute. Uh, so this is our budget. Obviously, now the the city, I'm sorry, planning development services is just planning and the building department. Code compliance went to Office of Public Safety last year. The next slide. Uh, we aren't looking at much of a difference this year. We are changing the allocation of the director and assistant director salary to the building fund. In the past, because there were three divisions within the department, a third of the salary for director and assistant director came from the building fund. Now that it's just the two departments, we're asking for that to increase to 20%, so it's essentially a 50-50 between the building fund and the general fund. And then again, the, the new request for the tactical urbanism program. From the building services fund, um, I am projecting a, a slight decrease in the overall permit fees for the upcoming year. And particularly that's just because uh, we only have a few major projects that will be coming this next year. You know, not all building permits are equal. So some building permits have a high ticket revenue, some building permits are regular ticket revenue. Um, and while I actually expect our 
number of permits to remain about the same. I do think we'll have a slight decrease in the overall permit fees. I have some graphs that I think will explain this a little bit further. So permits by year, and I want to make it uh, something that's important to, to, to note, is that the amount of permits by year is not just the building department. Multiple departments in the city review building permits. Zoning reviews approximately 95% of all building permits, environmental services, the fire department, sustainable management. Uh, multiple departments in the city have a responsibility to reviewing building permits. We have seen, of course, a decrease in the 2019-2020 review of permits. Uh, that was the beginning of the, um, uh, um, sorry, of the increase of you know uh, the economy. Um, we are about, you know, we're we're steadying out, right? So uh, this this 2021, we had a little more than 8,000. I expect to have a little less than than 8,000 this year, but still, I, I believe that we'll have a very consistent amount of building permits. And 8,000, approximately 8,000 building permits a year is an extremely high number. As far as revenue is concerned this year, I expect just a slight drop in our total revenue. Um, and I expect our revenue for next year to be just a, a slightly less than what this year's revenue will be again, just because of the value of permits. And just the last slide I think is of, of value to show is that we did make the change with the CGA contract. Uh, that CGA contract has actually benefited us, uh, even though as it shows the graph is the total revenue the city's received over the actual revenue um, of the building fund. In reality, we are actually currently tracking at about 20% retainership of revenue, whereas in the previous contract, we were at 15%. So in uh, fiscal year 21, we took on about $921,000, where in the previous contract, we would have taken on 706,000. And this year projected to take about 914,000, whereas last year, whereas if we were in the previous contract, it would have been 696,000. So it's important that this, this um, contract has is, is, is worked out the way it is because it allows the city to have the sort of a guaranteed amount of money that we need to, uh, to operate that fund. Dollars that were previously in the general fund that are now part of the building fund that help pay for uh, you know, a portion of my salary, a portion of um, uh, fires, uh, building inspection salaries, you know, software, uh, record retention, all these types of things that previously were in the general fund are now part of the building fund. And I think that was my last slide. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Eric, or actually Dave, just a little note for you. If any of these departments, when you talk about allocation for salary and how we split some, what percentage of them come out of different accounts or different departments? Mm -hmm. I, I know there's been some, that's usually something that opens us up, if not done properly, to issues when it comes to, um, you know, some of these agencies will take a look at it and say that, that, that you know, if they audit us and they take a look at it, I don't think that's the best way to go about it. We can just be cautious and make sure that we're doing that the way it's supposed to be done. Absolutely. And in, in light of that, we've um, scrutinized some of this a little bit more. Um, in, in Mr. Power's case, I think we're, we're looking good. And another reason why we're looking at the cost allocation study next year. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. You didn't think we were getting off the hook, did you? He's hoping. So one of the things that we discussed coming into tonight, which another priority of mine is the shady tree and right tree, right tree, right place programs. So one of the things that I asked, I don't know if you had an opportunity to do it, was you know, what dollars we associated to those programs in this fiscal year. Um, because I, I would like to see increases in those going going forward. Um, I, I, th I just think beautifying our city and and giving the residents uh, opportunities um, uh, is a good thing, you know, to put trees in our city and also to expand and to expand that program, you know, for more um, opportunities to participate for example and in particular you know homeowners associations and I, and and i think that should be something that you know we as the commission consider as as a policy to either make it a part of the program um i guess that would fall under the shady tree program in particular uh or making a subset of that program but some way that we can maximize the ability of the residents and the 
homeowners associations in our city to beautify themselves with trees. If, if someone wants to put in trees, I don't think, and I, and I realize there's other opportunities to do it. There's, there's two sides of this argument, but I think that we as a city should participate as full as we can to giving the residents and, and HOAs that, that opportunity. So that's, that's my personal belief. Um, I would like to see, you know, robust increases to those programs going, going forward. Um, because I don't think we should deny, you know, people the opportunity that want to participate, the ability to participate. Um, that's just my my firm belief on on that. Thank you. So um, I did do a little research based on your comment, and um, so so we currently have six hundred and forty three thousand dollars in our landscape fund. This past year, I came to commission with requests to um, begin budgeting some of those dollars for some of these programs. Uh, prior to this last year, the only program we had was the Shady Tree Program and the Tree Giveaway. We have uh, we made that request to increase the annual um, programs from what was only $10,000 to $32,000. And I wanted to start this first year fairly conservatively. You know. Um, we can definitely look at increasing those values. But my concern is, is that this is a fund which, while it seems that it's healthy, it does have finite resources in which uh, we don't have uh, annual contributions coming into this fund. And what we do have is large scale projects that come out of this fund for, for large scale beautification. So as some quick examples, you know, the, the project that we did for Dixie Highway cost approximately $100,000 that came from the fund, the improvements we've done to Hillsborough Boulevard, the improvements we did to Brent Hilda Richardson Knowles Memorial Park and Historic Cemetery, um, the improvements that we'll be doing to some of the medians, some of those dollars do come from that fund. And so what happens is that every year, every other year, every three years, you see a large chunk come from that. But I do feel confident that we can increase um, the, the, the dollars that would come from this to um, help homeowners. Uh, we'll look at that program and see how we can increase that on an annual basis. I just want to make sure that the fund is is uh, consistent and can be and can be healthy. But can't we, as the commission, fund the fund? You certainly can, but I don't really want to come here and ask for money from the general fund for something that's you know earmarked right now. I'd like to be able to you know spend the money and not come and ask you for it. <laughs> well, I I understand, but there has to be a way that we can give. I mean, because the, the fund does these large scale projects, but I'm, you know, and, and those are important as well. Don't get me wrong, but I'm also focused on, you know, resident and HOA ability to participate as, as well. So if we can somehow those dollars have to filter down to those, to those programs. And if they're, and if they're being held back because of large scale projects, um, you know, then what can we as the commission do to fund the smaller the smaller projects uh, to make sure that those at least get implemented. So keep the money in your in your landscape fund for your big projects, and let us as the commission um, put dollars, however which way the city manager sees it, into those smaller those smaller funds because I think those need to be. I think there's a need out there for the residents to take um, advantage advantage of that. I know there's you know in, in my community alone, for example. Um, uh, in Starlight Cove, there's 313 homes, and at one point there was roughly a third uh, after Hurricane Wilma. That actually there was more, but a couple of years after that, the HOA went and took an assessment of how many homes did not have the required tree in the front swale, and there was roughly a third. So a third of 313 homes did not lose that. Excuse me, did not have that tree either because of Hurricane Wilma. Or because the homeowner just decided he or she didn't want it and took it out in, under the cover of darkness. Um, but I will tell you that the Shady Tree Program has been a huge benefit to the uh, residents to be able to put that swale tree back. And so I know there's a cost share um, component to that. But I mean, where can you get? I mean, I think it's what $150 now. I don't. We, we changed it to 50% of the cost of the tree last right. year. So, I, I mean, you still can't go buy a tree on your own installed for whatever the price is. I mean, it's the best deal in, in, in town. And so I think to encourage residents, not only in, in every neighborhood to do that, I think is just a good policy that we should be setting forth here in the, in, in the city. So in, in HOAs that want to beautify themselves as well, for example, there's another um, association in my district uh, on a large piece of you know property, we're very cost prohibitive for them to beautify uh, that particular, and they want to participate 
uh, in some type of cost share program. So I'm not saying that we have to give these trees for free to HOAs and the residents. Certainly there can be a cost share component to it, uh, but we as a city need to do uh, all that we can to help make sure that those programs are fun and funded so those that want to take advantage can take advantage. And the best case scenario would be is that we don't have enough funds, that there's too many HOAs and residents that want to take advantage and they get put on a waiting list or pushed to the next um, uh, uh, fiscal year. That would be a good problem to have because one, we're putting more trees in our city uh, and two, we know that people are taking advantage of the program. So whatever way, I'll leave the, the logistics up to you guys, but me as the policymaker want to see those programs um, funded more than they are. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Powell. I, I will say that the B tactical B tactical project, we get so much praise from other cities about that project. And people need to realize that it's a ability to do something temporary to see if it works long term as opposed to building something long term to find out it doesn't work. So excellent work on that. Thank you. And next we have the presentation for economic development. Ms. Mori is uh, not able to attend tonight, but uh, we are in good hands with Ms. Chazu here and, and welcome. And she will be providing um, some, some of the presentation and, and I will be doing that as well. So we've already worked out who will be doing which part. Good evening, Gigi Chazu, Economic Development Coordinator. Okay, the recent achievements for the Department of Economic Development, we can see that the uh, continued COVID response to minimize the negative impacts of business and workers. Uh, this department continues uh, supporting the, the businesses that suffered during the pandemic, as well as the workers that were out of work with the different programs that this department provides to the citizens. Uh, residents and even employees of the companies, even though they are not uh, city residents. Um, also, we have been able to graduate 92 people uh, from the Ready to Work program. Uh, the Ready to Work pro program is the workforce development uh, initiative that the city has provided for the past two years. And um, so it, it has proven that the if people are interested in continuing uh, that type of training. Um, another of the achievements that we have is a recent partnership with Florida Atlantic University. Uh, there, uh, the Small Business Development Center has opened a satellite office in the, in the CRA and Economic Development Building. Uh, this is something that we were trying to put together for the past probably three years. Uh, fortunately now with the new, uh, the new leadership in the Small Business Development Center, now it's a reality. And uh, we are now in partnership with Florida Atlantic University. Even also they are going to be providing um, programming for the business incubator that might open uh, next fiscal year. Uh, also, uh, uh, the department continues providing small business and entrepreneurship training. There's over 800 participants to date. Uh, just uh, to uh, give you a, a small picture of what this entails, this, is, this has even international reach, putting really Deerfield Beach out there. So we have had people from Brazil and from Portugal when we uh, have offered um, training in Portuguese uh, because of the big Brazilian population that we have. We want to capture and we want to help those entrepreneurs. Brazil is proven to be, uh, I think it's the third uh, economy that contributes to Florida. So that's why this department wants to really capture uh, that population. And also with the, um, with the partnership with the Small Businesses Development Center, they just informed me that they just hired a um, exporting expert that uh, speaks uh, Portuguese. So that's gonna be continued uh, support to this population. 
Um, of course, as you may uh, remember, uh, this department recently uh, was able to complete the commuter rail station study with the Urban Land Institute, which of course um, helped the city to be able to demonstrate what a better uh, location could be uh, in that private owner uh, lot. Uh, not only for the city, but also for the residents. Um, the, uh, the city was also recently designated as the business recovery center for any uh, disasters, which is also a great advantage for the population. That's going to be where we're going to be designated for the Upper Broward County. So that means that other cities might come to here uh, to uh, get support if a disaster strikes. Um, the higher DSB program uh, continues, we uh, were able to uh, support Publix uh, this year, which uh, they provided 600, 600 new jobs with their recent expansion. And out of, out of those 600 new jobs, 69 Deerfield Beach residents were able to be incentivized to the, through the higher DSB program. All those 69 residents were retained for six months. Um, 365 new businesses uh, are um, have been opening here in Deerfield Beach. That's uh, year to date, and uh, that demonstrates that entrepreneurship is stronger than ever. On the current initiatives, um, the Small Business Development Center, as I mentioned before, uh, we are going to be opening a the uh, business incubator uh, with programming from Florida Atlantic University. They, that's a program that is very strong and uh, they are going to even provide the platform so that the incubative could access uh, the site and the classes and the mentoring, not only on site, but also on the web. Um, business education is gonna continue uh, the reason why, of course, we, uh, you know, it's known that two thirds of new jobs are created by small businesses and they, they, are, they contribute to 44% of the economy. So it's a no brainer. Um, the ready to work program, uh, it's being enhanced with the uh, memorandum of understanding with Broward College, which now has expanded the reach to Deerfield Beach. Uh, specifically to the zip codes 33441 and 33064. And uh, we are still, still in talks uh, with uh, their leadership to see how that is gonna be implemented and not only implemented, but also communicated to the, uh, to the residents of Dirtle Beach. Um, we continue with connecting, expanding and potential businesses with resources that is a continuum to make sure that those businesses that really contribute to the city stay here. Um, of course, also another initiative is the pl continued platinum permitting services uh, in conjunction with uh, the uh, greater for Lauder Alliance. And the two key um, assistance uh, that we have provided is to two companies, one is Ferro, Ferros is adding 35 new jobs to the city, and uh, they are manufacturers of um, like wide level medicine. And uh, all of those uh, new jobs are gonna be uh, over $100,000 per year. Um, the Maharaj Institute also, it's, uh, they are a biogenoma storage space that is gonna be where uh, DNA labs used to have their facilities. So they're occupying that area. They, they are starting with five employees, but they are thinking in expanding in the next three years up to 35 new employees. And those are only scientists. Um, and of course, uh, another of the initiatives that the department is uh, working with planning and zoning is the invitation to negotiate uh, real estate development for specific this site, uh, what's called the farther site. 
future considerations. And as the city manager said earlier, I mean, we have to be on the look for a potential recession. Uh, it's as we have seen a significant slowdown in the global growth, which has been intensified uh, for the uh, Ukrainian war. So we have to be prepared and make sure that we have the resources to respond timely. Um, the physical implications of the new economy, we continue seeing uh, the shrinking of businesses and office buildings because of what uh, we have been saying before, people want more and more to work from home. Uh, recently, I have a, a talks with a company that provides uh, roofing uh, uh, coats uh, for uh, industrial buildings and they purchased a three-story building. And they told me that uh, after the pandemic, they realized that they, don't, they did not need that much space because of the new characteristics of the new workers. Um, the commuter, uh, uh, we have to make sure that the uh, central, central city strategy implementation uh, gets in place. Uh, that's one of the things that this department has been working in the base on one day of what the Urban Land Institute study uh, um, that took place last year. So we've been working on that. We're currently hiring for the position of the uh, redevelopment uh, coordinator that is gonna be working for that area. We're lucky that we have 24 applicants. So <laughs> you who? And uh, so uh, the, um, the, I think that uh, the uh, interviews are gonna be probably in the next two weeks. Then uh, of course, other consideration is the commuter rail uh, timeline. Uh, we have also to be ready. We were lucky that we have a very positive um, study with the Urban Land Institute with a very good alternative for that, uh, for that uh, um, plan. So we have to make sure that we are ready and we have to sit down with the community and with all the stakeholders to make sure that we know what to do and when to do it. Um, also, uh, we have to uh, work with other departments to the, uh, and redevelop the Central City and West Deerfield Beach. So uh, that's something that is, of course, in the foreseen future. And uh, we are working also with the Greater for Lauderdale Alliance with the job creation incentive. As you may know, the um, qualified uh, target uh, industry, the QTI, is no longer in place and they are implementing the new incentive. We recently had a uh, meeting with the um, Broward County's Economic Development Department, and uh, they told us that probably by the end of this year or the beginning of next year, that incentive is gonna be ready. They are not even sure how it is gonna work or, or how it's gonna be called, but the city is ready. We put some money in the budget to be ready for whenever they have it. So we're gonna be able to match that incentive. Um, of course, it's gonna be an increased focus on entrepreneurship and small business development. One of the uh, trends that we see is that those people that are not applying for jobs or those individuals that still are um, not joining the job, the, the job force is because they're opening build, uh, businesses. Uh, unfortunately, some of them we cannot capture because as Eric was saying, people think that they can do whatever from their homes and that, that has increased a lot, the home-based home businesses. So uh, we're going to try to capture those with education, not only in the part on how to open a business, but also how to navigate uh, the system. And one of the initiatives that is not here, but it's, it's good to say is that we recently published on the city's website and I, how to open a business in Durfield Beach handbook. And the handbook is available online in three languages. It's in Spanish, Portuguese, and English. Uh, another future consideration is the film initiative. 
Uh, we recently with Pam, uh, we had a meeting with Sandy Lederman, which is the new um, film um, uh, executive director for Broward County. She used to be the person for Miami-Dade. And as you know, the film industry in Miami-Dade, of course, it was very successful. And that was mostly in part because of her. So she brings that experience to Broward County. And uh, she met with us just to make sure to include us in that plan. She said that it's important to capture all the content creation that was done during COVID. So we have to also capture that and having two industries here in Deerfield Beach, two companies that are here in Deerfield Beach that are huge, such as Maverick Entertainment, uh, even, uh, I mean, in, and the uh, brand, brand star as well. <laughs> so we have to work with her to make sure that we capture that industry. The streaming during the pandemic, again, was huge and we need to really uh, bank on that. And of course, an increased participation with the Economic Development Council that I think that uh, um, it's, uh, the, this department may be absorbing many of those um, tasks that they used to have to work with them and expand the reach as well and their impact. Thank you, Ms. Chazu. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and take it from here to talk more specifically about the numbers. Um, in the, the budget recommendation uh, from the director it is the addition of an administrative uh, support specialist. Uh, this is a low level administrative position. Again, the, this cost is uh, fully baked in with, with, with benefits uh, and insurance costs. Also, a recommendation for a reclassification from the economic development coordinator position to a business development manager. Um, this position's uh, roles, responsibilities, time commitments have expanded greatly throughout the years. Um, many of the programs that you have seen in the previous slides are a direct result of, of that position's uh, efforts. Um, also, increase in the, in the workforce training programs. Um, it was, you know, very, uh, very apparent through the presentation and some of the slides previously that the workforce training initiatives that um, we've seen have paid uh, tremendous dividends uh, for our residents and our outreach uh, to the international community. And I, we believe that those, uh, that continuation of those programs would be of, of great benefit uh, to the city of Deerfield Beach. And lastly, an increase in, in marketing. Uh, our marketing dollars, uh, we were hopeful that we would see increased uh, marketing through uh, other organizations in the past. Haven't necessarily seen that. Um, so we would like to take on a larger role in economic development uh, marketing strategy. And with that, I can be happy to address any questions. You know, we did the study uh, with the Urban Land Institute, and there were some very, very encouraging ideas uh, about what could happen. But you know what it boils down to? You can have a lot of great ideas about a lot of things, but if you don't have any money, it's just not going to happen. You need money. And when you look at District 2, it is very undeveloped. It is economically deprived. Now, when that happens, when you look at an area that's not developed, is economically deprived, now what are the effects of that? The effects is that there's a greater dependency on social services, and I will guarantee you law enforcement and fire rescue will tell you that the call volume is greater. And then when you look at District 2 in comparison to its neighbors, District 1, 3, and 4, there's a, there's a, there's a big, huge difference economically and um, uh, you see those districts thriving economically a lot more my question is you know what can we do solidly i mean what can be a solid plan from the city to attack that or do we have anything commissioner that's that's a that's a great question and it's 
there's many ways to to approach this and some of that is done through if you and I, I will say this i've said this again i'll say it today if you build it they will come so when we talked about the cip program and you look at some of the infrastructure that we're looking to put in to areas like um, pioneer grove uh, you look at FAU Research Boulevard. FAU Research Boulevard, as we know, is one of the is is one of the areas that uh, is, is the most deprived. Um, it's the opportunity zone for us, designated opportunity zone for us. And you look at projects like the Disney, uh, Disney excuse me, Dixie uh, Highway Beautification Project that's associated. I'll with take Disney coming in. I mean. That'd be a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they want to build over there. It'd be a great thing. Well, go ahead. Well, the Dixie Highway um, uh, landscape beautification and, and, and fence project and some of the improvements that you're seeing there. But you're right, we do have a more comprehensive plan through the ULI. What needs to occur really is, and what has been occurring, is a look at what the options are, okay? So one, from a zoning perspective, we've gotten some recommendations from, um, from the ULI that we need to implement some of the zoning recommendations that have been made to the ULI, and that's something that I believe Mr. Power is looking to tackle. So you've got the infrastructure, you've got the zoning, but more importantly, you have to look at the the how do you, what economic engine are you going to use in that central core of the city in the downtown area as well as the Disney business residential area to spark the development within the private sector, right? Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, really it becomes manpower and resources and this is why some of these recommendations are being made within this this budget um, that you see more particularly on, on on this slide is to align the manpower hours to ensure that we have the resources to implement what some of these you know major projects are when you go back and you look at some of the the current initiatives right now and you look at the future considerations a lot of it is a result of the efforts of this very small department but we've got major big projects that we're looking at too. You talk about the partnership with, with Broward Up, you talk about um, the partnership with FAU, you talk about the partnership with Guy Harvey. Um, a lot of these are, are huge economic projects that simply just, it's a lot to juggle at once. Mm -hmm. And so um, we look at these things and we wanna make sure that we have the resources dedicated to it. What's interesting to me is um, we've had conversations in the past, um, you know, with the commission about what what's the appropriate vehicle to inject the the economic engine, if you will, into this this downtown area. We've looked at, and, and you've spoken, commissioner, about the creation of a CRA. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing that we want to do is we want to research. Well, what 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 are all the options out there? And what's what's really interesting to me, and 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 Miss Mori could be if 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 she was available to speak on this, she could certainly talk probably more eloquently eloquently on the subject than me. But one of the interesting things that that we've we've discovered is that years ago, even prior to the current CRA being created, there were economic there were economic um, uh organizations establish an economic funding established to bring up that central core of the city the problem is is that it, i don't think it really ever was followed through on so we we've kind of i mean not to not to sound like an archaeologist here but we've kind of uncovered some things that were in place years and years ago that i think mm. knowing that now um there's some other options available to us and by other options i mean maybe other options or supplemental options that um you know aren't necessarily a, a, a tifless cra and just as a reminder a tifless cra is what we would have in that area because the county is not gonna not gonna participate in that so there's there's some things that we might be able to regenerate to get the ball rolling um, but all this takes 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 manpower and resources. So let me ask you this: Can we those things that you've uncovered that was in place years ago? Can we revive that? Can we staff that? Can we get that going 
as something uh, so they will uh, it will turn out to be something very productive. We 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 could we can and again it's it's um, I think what we need to do now that we've kind of looked back in the records and and seen that um, it wasn't necessarily just uh, there were there were some things back in the past that that were meant to spark development in the central area just I don't think followed through or taken advantage of. Um, I think now we need to take all those options and we need to put those together. I think we need to get back with the city commission as a whole and and show what was done, what was what still can be considered, what some of the other options are, and then how we, we can tackle that. Yeah. I'm very encouraged to hear that there was something in place and for lack of better terminology or whatever, is it just forgotten about or it wasn't utilized but to know that the city had something in place. Uh, there, there is something that I did not understand about the, you know, the, the, the CRA, if you look at it from a legal perspective, it says that you cannot start one unless you have it in an area that's blight and slum. And so when you take that, that definition, automatically I applied uh, that to District 1 where it was, where it could have been in a more blighted area and a slum area. But here's the thing, nobody could probably anticipate at the time, because we can look at the CRA right now and say, look how well it's doing. At the time, that's probably would be the issue. Nobody would know that the CRA would actually develop to where it, 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 it is to, to now. So it, it's an easy target now. It's an easy target mm -hmm. to say, um, you know, that, uh, you know, Hey, look at how well it's doing and whatever. But you know, you couldn't see that way back when. From what I'm hearing from you, there was a separate plan here in place to be able to attack the very challenges that's been there for a long time. Now it's up to us to be able to say because the city actually did think of those things, revive those things, and bring those things forward so that we can move on it. Because with the funding engine we'll be able to to get things done. I, I never really looked at it. Um, you know, I started really thinking about it. The CRA uh, is an easy target because, you know, and, and, and believe me, I've been challenged with it because it sits there. And in 1999, you don't have to be a genius to know where the most blighted and, and, and slum area was in Deerfield Beach. But, but here's the thing. Did anybody know at the time that it was going to be as productive as it was? And they didn't know that. No, there's no way you can know. So I'm on board with you getting, you know, coming back to us w with reviving what was already in place and seeing how it can help. Thank you. Uh, let, let me say this. Um, you know, District 2, you talk about it being economically not in the same place. Certainly the spending that the city has done in, in District 2 doesn't represent that. We have put in between everything we did with the Dixie Highway fence, the FAA Research Boulevard, what we've done with the Tigner Center, two, two of the three projects that we earmarked for our bonds that we went out for uh, are located in District 2, Tigner Center and the Center for Active Aging. The last two community centers built in the city of Deerfield Beach were built in District 2. We moved the teen center from District 4 to District 2. Um, we've got the Boys and Girls Club expansion that's going on. The, the city's investment in District 2 has been tremendous. Every, there are a select few people that like to say, well, District 2 is always getting slighted. That was in the past. The investments that have been made in the last 10 years in District 2 have been tremendous. And they're investments that probably wouldn't have happened if we didn't have a CRA over on the beach area. I think the problem with the CRA is it's called Community Redevelopment Agency. So that automatically makes and as you noted about it, talking about blighted areas, there were certainly areas, if you go back to some of the early CRA projects that were blighted, nothing like you would find in some reports in the city. But the improvements that I just listed, as well as what we've invested in District 2, wouldn't have happened if we had to spend that money on trying to redo our piers that we just prayed. Mm -hmm. That there was a lot of CRA money that went towards that. I think it was an easy uh, decision in 1999 to take a look at where can I get the most bang for our buck. Therefore, less money comes out of the general fund to cover those things. We would spend it. Look at all the improvements we've done along the beach area. Everything that we promote in the, in the underwater camera, all that stuff wouldn't be done. 
I think that's what the other water carriers are. Some of those parts of those wetted tracks would have been done if the CRA wasn't created yet. Should they have done two? They should have done two. They didn't do it. They just keep in mind that CRA was the last one created in Broward County. Last minute. I mean, the day before the deadline started. So if they had better planning and actually had some foresight, not only did they, they were smart to know that that's the most bang for the buck is because it's incremental on the tax revenue. In order for a CRA to have been successful in District 2, the property value should have had it gone out. What do you think would have happened to the revenues of District 2? In order for them to get enough money to support themselves over there in that infrastructure or, or view the changes like you see on the beach, their, their property value should have had those gone out. They wouldn't want that. They probably didn't want that. Then. And I think that's some of the, historically, when you talk to them about it, even when they redevelopment where we're at right now, they didn't want their property values raised. That's only some point. people. The, there were other people that understand that growth uh, actually entails that your property value will go up. And when I say undeveloped, here's what I mean. I mean, in comparison to businesses, like what you would see in District 1, District 3, and 4, we don't, we don't even really have in District 2 a very good restaurant for people to go out and eat. And that's what I'm talking about. The businesses represented in the different districts, District 2 is not as functioning business-wise as is the other districts. And so that if there is a plan mm -hmm. to be able to deal with those things, to bring it up, some things will go down. You're not going to have many people leaning on social services. Call volume and negative ways go down. And so, but, but what I looked at, you know, like you say, maybe two should have been invent, uh, uh, put in place when they initially did it, they did not do that. So District 2 being the most blighted and the most loan suffered. But here's the thing about that. It's an easy target now because you can look at that and say, look at the money and you can say, look at how it affected. But 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 you wouldn't have known that at the time. Well, it's also not an apples to apples compared. Yeah. <laughs> the money would have been different. Mm -hmm. totally different. In order for it to be the same, you would have to have property values in District 2 be equal to what they are in the CRA and by the beach. And that would never would happen without putting people out. Mm -hmm. So so it, it's not an apples to apples comparison. It should have done two. They that should have done that's right. But it wouldn't you never would have had the same amount of money because it's all based on tax information. So it's interesting. But it would have been funded. There would have been some funding yeah, that's right. Near, yeah. that's right. You, we, but well, you know what? We're making up for it because all like I said, we just all those things just listed, exactly. that's all money we're putting towards district two. I don't see that happening in District Four. I don't see that happening in District. Yeah, but 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 let me just say something. I'm actually asking for you know for something that he's saying. But but when you say that you're putting these projects that are there, that is a good thing, and you're putting them there because it's needed. There's not there's no there's no there's no like uh hey we're we're doing the good thing. You're doing the right thing because it's needed. And you're not you're not you're not blessing District Two with anything. I'm actually uh, okay, so it's needed. So don't don't well, think. Look at the projects, the economic development program, and the department. We're talking about one and a half people, ninety-two graduates for ready work to date program, six hundred to date for the small business entrepreneurship program. So these are programs that are available for everybody, whether you're in district one, two, or three. There's a higher Deerfield Beach. 59 residents. Their field two residents can take advantage of that just as much as any other resident. So there are programs available that the city is providing to District 1 residents, District 3 residents, District 4 residents, and District 2 residents. They can also take advantage of it. We had an opportunity to put a nice Wawa in District 2. What do they say? We don't want it. So there are programs that we are trying to put into District 2, but they also have to be open to it. We talked about the rezoning. I know Eric is looking into that because we do need to rezone that area. But that district also has to want those programs. Commissioner, they have to commissioner, take advantage of those programs. Look, commissioner, the people in the district want change. They want to grow. But, we're but, giving but, but, them those opportunities. Well, you, you, there is some exposure now. But I'm not going to let you or anybody else say that the reason that it's that way is because the people in the live, that live in that area, that's why it's that way, because they don't want no, this to know. That's that, not. They have opportunities the, to take advantage of it. Well, let me just tell you something. The things that they can take advantage of are things that they were already deprived of. The fact of the matter is, is that they, there's a reason that we are talking about what we're talking. 
for the last 20, 30, 40 years, very little in that district has changed. And it's right. not because of the people in the district. No, but we're because it's, we're talking about, you wanna, if you want to go that way, you're talking about money. You're talking about how th this city could benefit more with businesses in the other district Without as much as, okay, so, no. so I, I'm just saying and that as, it's a good thing, yeah. but if we want to go down that road, I'm willing to do it. No, but as the mayor pointed out too, we used the CRA money so that we didn't have to use the city, city money in order to build up things in District 1. We can use that money to build up things in District 2 like we're doing, like this commission has done. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, let's talk economic development with a one and a half people. They've done all of these programs. Mm -hmm. Well, if you heard what I said, I said to the, to the um, city manager that there was a tool, a mechanism that was discovered. And I said, hey, look into that and bring that to us. That's a positive. Yeah, yeah, but I'm not going to, excuse me? That's great. Thing. You know, but I'm not going to let anybody point a finger and say, hey, the reason that that district is the way it is is because you don't want anything. The Wawa thing, being that you brought it up, is it up. because the people in that area wanted more input. They felt that that could be a better use of the land. So to, just to say that they didn't, well, he was a Wawa, you know, uh, that's not the, that's not what it was. It, the people in the area, which most of that area was privately owned, right. okay, it's that's not what, that was not considered to be the best use. The city, there is nothing there now. And that's the point. Is that, 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 that's my point, is that for so long, because of lack of communication, people not being able to be considered, right. they were left behind. Right. They were left behind. The fact of the matter is, is the CRA should have never, why was it on the beach? Because you got a higher tax increment to the city. So it left a part of its citizens behind for money. But that no, money it didn't. That I'm sorry. I disagree with that. Just of course you disagree one. with it. Well, hold on. We used the district two. Hold on. What, what do I have to talk to? Two or one? Which one? I was talking to him and you jumped in. So let's go. Okay. Okay, go. All right, I'm going to go. You're wrong. I'm okay. telling you right now. Not, How literally. can you say that I'm wrong? It's your opinion I, that I'm I wrong. You, it's my your opinion that I'm wrong. Does not mean I'm wrong? I I think your opinion is wrong. Okay, fine. Okay, your opinion. I think your opinion is wrong. Good. Okay. Let's prove it. Because the money that came into the CRA for that area is more money than ever would have come in coming out of District Two, Three, or Four. That's just a fact. It's not. It's not a lie. That's not an opinion. That's a fact. Okay. More valuable. Each area is always going to be more valuable than anywhere else. Certainly going to be more than where I live. All right? That's just a fact. That money wasn't taken out of District 2's pocket because of that, because of putting it over there. It actually increased the money to be used in the other district. That's a fact. It's not an opinion. It's a fact. Now, whether you think that some of that money in the past should have been spent more in District 2 than it was in 3 and 4, that's a good argument. But I'll tell you right now, I just listed all the things that are going on in District 2 that we've invested in, mm -hmm. that trying to make up for some of that gap that you're talking mm -hmm. about. Because I agree that probably 30, 20 years ago that happened. Mm -hmm. But I can see right now, all that investment, that investment's not happening in District 4, not happening in District 3. It doesn't need it. It, it, it doesn't, it doesn't need, need it. I disagree with you on okay. that. But I, but I will say this. That is a good point. There are areas that certainly need it more than others. So I okay, let, let me just say this. Yeah. When you look at the CRA, uh, when the state uh, created it, mm -hmm. there, it created it for areas like District 2. That was the reason that it was created. And I would right. argue that when there was an, uh, you know, we most of your CRAs, if you look at it, most of them are on the beach areas if you go through the county. I would argue that th they didn't need it. There was an easterly migration of businesses to the beach. I would argue that the beach in the way that it's, it's, it's vibrant now economically, didn't need the CRA. It was gonna happen anyway. It was gonna happen anyway. They didn't need that help. Do you think the funds we got from the CRA we'd have gotten anywhere else? Do, do, do you the mean the funds that, that the city what, received the cent, the cost of the CRA? You probably, have gotten you probably wouldn't else. have gotten as much. Correct. Okay, simply because of the values of the home, because those people have to pay into it, and you had other engines that were a part of it. But the fact remains that when the when when the state did that, the state looked at it this way. They looked at areas like Deerfield Beach and all areas. Say these two, these these groups are behind. What can we do? So they created a CRA. 
But, but many politicians said, hmm, if we take advantage of this, we'll be able to have more money that will come into our city coffers. So you look at what happened, you look at, uh, uh, there was a migration of businesses coming to the beach. And my assertion is that they, they didn't really need the CRA. They didn't really need the CRA because it was going to happen anyway. Be uh, beaches, whether they have the CRA or not, on the East Coast are thriving anyway. And it would have happened in Deerfield Beach as well. Now, the money that we received from the CRA, we took some of it with her too, especially- Which is a good thing. Okay. It's a good thing. Okay. You didn't hear me argue that. Okay. I want to make sure. Yeah. All right. Yeah. You didn't hear me argue that, but, 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 but- So that, now this economic development department, that the DP has one and a half people. Are we going to talk about the numbers finally? But this is not CRA, this is economic development. Well, listen, un, but the see, but but development in a district is under economic development. So True. I'm here to talk about economic development. And so however we talk about so that, you're we're like gonna do it. Programs? Uh, want, uh, well, there's some merit, but uh, but my thing was as I had said to the city manager, mm -hmm. which was positive mm -hmm. until you know, we got to where we are. But I'm just saying to you, I'm willing to stay here as long because I'm not gonna let you or anybody else tell me that the money went to where it was supposed to go to, because it didn't. It's going there now. Okay, that's fine. Okay, you wanna do that. That's all we can do is fix what we can do. We yeah, that's right, back. that's right. And so I'm okay with that. what we can do. Uh, but I, I'm okay with that. Okay. But let's understand its history. Let's understand yeah. why we got to let's, where we are, and let's not point at a group of people and say the reason that you're not where you need to be is because you didn't want to be there to begin with. I because I won't let I room. won't let that go by. We'll we stay here about, all night long. I said we talked about the zoning. I said, okay, fine. Okay, all right, we're good. No, we needed you in the office not to just twenty years ago. That was a problem. <laughs> Failed leadership at the time. It was. It was. Mr. Drosky, you want to say something? Hi, Gigi. <laughs> oh. Listen, I'm going to jump in at my own peril on, on this. So it is my belief to my core that Hillsborough Boulevard from Dixie Highway to I-95 on its own will be a very different place in five to 10 years from now. Um, it will look significantly different than it does right now, and it'll do it on, on its own. What needs help is Dixie Highway from Hillsborough Boulevard south to Sample Road. Commissioner Preston, you know, as Gigi was giving her presentation, you know, see, I put big stars next to the Central City uh, strategy implementation, because that to me is, key to this city developing in the future way way long after i am out of office way long after i'm out of office but that's going to be the key for deerfield beach going future going forward in the future now how do we accomplish that um obviously nobody's figured it out for the last 50 plus years and i'm not pretending i'm going to figure it out tonight but it's really many multiple layers to, to that onion i mean the city can participate to a certain extent that the recommendations by the ULI, I think, will go a long way. Uh, implementing the coordinator is a, is a good start. Um, changing the zoning is a good start as well. But that's only going to get us so far. The residents have to be on board, too. And they haven't, and let's be honest, they haven't always been on board uh, as well with what development needs to go in that particular area. And it's not just immediately at Hillsborough and Dixie. This goes all the way to Sample. It's in that entire corridor that I'm, that I'm talking about. So what is the answer here? The answer is the department that's before us, in my opinion. It's Gigi and Chris. They are the answer because they are going to have to go out and recruit somebody, some business, to come in and take a chance on Deerfield Beach and that Dixie cor corridor area. And that's her job to sell it. And her job to bring somebody in saying that Deerfield Beach is the best, and that's why. And when she brings in somebody, that's going to bring in the next person, and that's going to bring in the next person, and that's going to bring in the next person. It's going to be a domino effect. So it's their job, her job, city manager's job to bring in that one person, that one business, that one team, whoever it is, 
into that area. And then I promise you the dominoes will fall from there. It may not be overnight. It may not take as fast as we want it to, but that's, in my opinion, how that corridor is going to get redeveloped. It's going to be her team bringing in somebody. And how do we make her job easier? We can do the rezoning. Sure, that helps. It helps her market and sell Deerfield Beach better. We can put in the fencing, yes. But she's going to have to prove to everybody why Deerfield Beach is the best environment for my business to come here, why my employees should work here, why I should do business in the city of Deerfield Beach. I can't do that, but that's her job. That's her training. She can, she can certainly do that. So that's my opinion, how this is going to eventually resolve itself. It's not a CRA. Um, it's not the rezoning by itself. It's not just throwing money at something. It's a combination of all those factors. But in the end, what's going to start that domino effect, in my opinion, is the economic development team selling to somebody that Deerfield Beach is where they should be. You know, uh, Commissioner, I think that you made some very good points, spoken very well. However, I will say to Gigi, it's not going to be that easy either, because let's just say, let's use a business, Red Lobster. You, you let them see the area, because there's a reason why no business have, to this point, went there. There's a reason why. They've seen it. I mean, the potential. There's a reason. What's that reason? She's not going to only have to convince them that Deerfield Beach is the best place to build. She's going to have to overcome stereotypes of a business. In other words, you're going to have to come with a plan to that Red Lobster. Maybe a tax plan might do it. Mm -hmm. Now, if you build this, you know, no taxes the first year, okay? Maybe the second year you pay 25, but you're going to have to come with something because it's not an idea of saying, you know, there's a, uh, there is an area that's available and that you should, you will come in and, and put up in, in a nice business and and it will grow from there it'll be a reason why it grows somebody has to take a chance and we're going to in the end have to offer them something to take that chance it won't be as easy as identifying a business and saying hey put it in now maybe if we said to red lobster like i said we got a tax plan here and they were interested they're halfway there maybe we push them over the you know over the over the line to be able to do it with some sort of thing but it's not going to be as easy as the business you know of being there because they're stereotypes and we got to get over that but okay also, i mean that's that's fine i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna jump in i'm gonna jump in while it's on my, well, on my well, head the here. residents own the land and you also have to convince the residents that they want a red lobster there and that they want to work with red lobster yes. and that's what we talked about with the Wawa. They didn't want the Wawa. Right. Right. They didn't want to work with them. Right. So it's not just the business and giving them a tax break. You also have to get the owners of that land to agree, yeah, this is the business that we want there. Mm -hmm. And that's when we talked about with the ULI was that there has to be community leaders that are working with the GG, with the city, to get a game plan together so that we're all in agreement. Yeah, Red Lobster is what we need here. Right. And that's what missing. We can push all we want. She can push all she wants. And the owners of that property says, no, nah, we don't want it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Well, what were you saying, Commissioner? Again, there's so many layers to this onion. We're not going to solve it tonight. But this is why we're meeting tonight is to give the tools to the various departments that they want to do yeah. their jobs. Mm -hmm. And so if, if Gigi and Chris need something and it's not in their presentation, they need to tell us. This is what they need. We're the policymakers. They're going to run it from day to day. So I'm going to trust them to tell what tools that they need from us to help them accomplish their objectives. Now, now the mayor was saying about the investment that was in the city, and it shows that this commission has been very cognizant of what has been happening in the district and in that area, and there is a concern that there needs to be change. You, you, you are witnessing a lot of that change, but um, you said maybe we're not going to solve it tonight, but maybe tonight we can have a definitive plan because what the city manager said that there was something in place a long time ago and for whatever the reason it was got and it was dealing with that area. We need to revive that. We need to look at that, see what that was and see how it could be implemented into what, you know, um, what they're doing uh, with, you know, in, in the agencies that we already have in place. How do we put, you know, a team of people in place to be able to attack it 
and be able to bring us, uh, you know, a plan, and that we all get on board. But this commission has done some good things in terms of attacking it. But there is a reason why a red lobster has not come there, and it's not always because of the race. Yes, they are. A, a, there are a key component, but you're going to have to, as I said before, you're going to have to march them past stereotypes. Now, if you were to if you were to look at a CRA area that was not included many many years ago, if you were to get off of I-95 and go down Atlantic Boulevard, you could really see the difference between primarily black area and then uh, where it was where there was more white residents. If you get off of I ninety five now and drive down Atlantic, you can't tell the difference. You can drive from there and you see all the businesses and you go right to the beach. You won't tell the difference. And you know who, who did that? Yeah. If you go down to Fort Lauderdale though, on Six Mountain Boulevard, which used to have a very negative yeah, you know, it, it was very negative. You go down there and look now, and I remember when it was not so good. Right now, it is thriving. It's very vibrant. Why is that? The CRA came in. In other words, there was a mechanism, a plan in place that changed the dynamic. And that's what we're talking about here. And that was people getting together, talking about a plan, implementing it. A lot of businesses right now on Smith Front Boulevard is just doing great. My assertion is this. If it works, it doesn't necessarily have to be a CRA. But with a working plan in place, you're going to see change. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need. That's what we need. Okay, you go down right here on Hammondville, uh, Hammondville uh, Boulevard right here. Think about it 15, 20 years ago and go look at it now. It's changed a lot. Who did it? CRA. And you know how they did it? Because there was money. Let's do this, let's do that. When money gets to be a part of the criteria, you can do a lot of things, okay? But guess what? You can want to eat steak, you can want to have a lobster meal, but if you ain't got no money in your pocket, it ain't gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. That was, we've got good direction from that conversation, thank okay. you. Um, and what we were talking about, um, Gigi, no pressure. So one more presentation to go. Uh, thank you very much. One more presentation to go, and that's uh, our community services department. Uh, Mr. Salas will be presenting this evening for them. And this, this will be the last presentation for the evening. Let's follow the Beatles there, buddy. Good evening, Mayor Commission. Jonathan Salas, Acting Director for the Community Services Department, where life happens. We were formerly known as the Center for Active Aging and the Legislative and Community Affairs Department, which we merged last year. So this year, we're Community Services. Um, my colleagues gave me eyes to make this swift. <laughs> so I'm gonna make this as swift as possible. So when we look at recent achievements, <laughs> When we look at recent achievements under awarded grants and appropriations, we have $3.2 million, which these are competitive grants. Um, when we look down to our next item here, we have pending grants and appropriations. We have 5.7 million, and that encompasses our earmark for shot spotter, uh, the $2.6 million including here for the fencing along the Dixie Highway corridor. So um, as we move along, entitlement grants, we have 1.7 million which these, this is our CDBG, our SHIP, our HOME, our Older American Act funds. When we segue into our housing programs, we assisted 29 residents. Out of that 29, eight were purchase assistance and 21 were rehab. And we currently have 12 projects in construction. So when we look at our rental utilities assistance program, we've assisted 118 households. Uh, we've been successful at reestablishing our affordable housing advisory committee. The state, uh, the state new statutes require that if you receive a full allocation of SHIP funding, that you should have an AHAC. So we received our full allocation of SHIP funding the past two years, which we were able to reestablish our AHAC and they've been very successful. Um, as we move along, we look at our Meals on Wheels program. 
The city, we're a congregate site. However, during the pandemic, we were able to deliver meals to seniors who are sheltered in place. So we delivered about 8,000 meals. Um, we were all present as part of the groundbreaking ceremony for the new Center for Active Aging, which that was long awaited. Everyone was very excited. We also rolled out a high school scholarship award program through Rotary. Rotary partnered with our Education Advisory Board. We were able to help two graduating seniors this year with a small scholarship, but it was something to help. Uh, as we move into our next slide with current initiatives, we have our community outreach component, which uh, one of my favorites was very busy in that area. That encompasses our book and toy drive, our food distribution, our health fairs, food distribution, backpack giveaways. And then we move down to our education advisory board. Uh, we've been, that board has matured, I can say over the past couple months. So uh, an issue we have there is partnering a member from the board with a school. So there'll be a li liaison to each school. So they'll be able to disseminate information from the city and the board to the schools and the schools will be able to disseminate information to them. So those liaisons will meet with the schools on a monthly basis so that we can have our presence in the schools. Um, so our tutoring initiative, this is something we've been doing for quite some time, which encompasses Reading Pals, Read for the Record, Tutomate, very successful at these programs. We had great outcomes over the years with these programs. So a, a very, very new initiative we have here on this list is our back to school block party, which we have it planned for August 6th at Ovita McKeithen Park. And we partnered with BSO and this will be in memory of Deputy Harold Morrison. So we're really looking to have a, in, in the past, we've had several backpack distribution events. So this is an opportunity to bring all of our partners together so that we can host one large backpack distribution. Uh, our citywide volunteer program, uh, it has expanded over, over the time. So we're looking to resume our volunteer award luncheon. We've, we've also worked with Pam to spotlight volunteers each month, which that program is going well as I, I can say. Uh, under our health and support services, we offer counseling group sessions, individual counseling. We have yoga, line dancing, and we're looking to roll out a tablet and cell phone training for our seniors. So very excited about that. Uh, during our care, uh, our next item, caregiver support group. Uh, with our caregivers, they've experienced a lot with the COVID pandemic and having uh, those uh, their those that they're caring for in the home. So we have coping mechanisms to help our caregivers cope with having them full time because a lot of these caregivers would you know drop their their pay, their their loved ones off to our center and pick them up at the end of the day. Now they're kind of dealing with them the entire day. So uh, something we're proud about as well is we remain open throughout construction. We're currently in construction phase of the new center. We've had portables that were delivered in the last couple of weeks and we'll move a lot of our programming into those portable trailers, whatever we want to call them. So we're very excited to keep our programming up and running through construction. Uh, so uh, another initiative we have here is reopening our adult daycare. Now that we have our modulars in place, we're working towards finalizing inspections and things like that so that we can bring those seniors back onto campus. And then we have our American Rescue Plan, which our department we've been tasked with uh, working with our consultants and project management. Uh, currently, we have 22 projects that are part of this American Rescue Plan. 16 of those projects are directly funded through ARP, and then we have six that are funded indirectly through ARP. So future considerations. Uh, one here that's very big is the implementation of my senior center and civic rec software technology. So civic rec is a technology that's used in parks already. So some of our seniors who attend events through parks, they're familiar with it. So we're going to just piggyback and bring that to the center. And with our my senior, my senior technologies, uh, this would allow our seniors so that right now there's a lot of paper trail. So with my senior, they'll have an ID where they'll come in and swipe themselves in. They have a record of who's on campus, emergency contact, any medications that they may be taking and so forth. So we're very excited to roll that out. So um, we want to work with parks to uh, create intergenerational collaborations. Um, we oftentimes have a lot of events at the center. We have a Father's Day dance that's coming up. So the goal would be to have the kids in parks come and maybe dance with the seniors at the prom or the Father's Day luncheon and, and so forth. So. Uh, uh, census data analysis, we know that we completed our census in 2020. So that, that data has been trickling in. So we would like to analyze that data so we can have a clear picture 
of the demographics of the city. Um, our CDBG five-year consolidated plan is due in fiscal year 24. However, there's a lot of planning that goes into this plan. So we're gonna start, you know, looking at where do we start and who are who are the constituents and residents that we want to meet with so that they can have input in this plan. So now we move into uh, anticipated concerns within the department. So there's always that potential for a decrease in federal, state, and county government funding, which this year we saw a decrease in our CDBG allocation, which we haven't seen a decrease in over seven years. The last seven years, we've constantly increased our allocation. This is the first year we've seen a decrease. Um, and then um, another concern that, you know, something just put on our radar is our city affordable housing crisis. And as we know, it's not something that's just taking place in Deerfield. A study done by FIU showed that in Broward County, 53% of the households are cost burden. So it's, it's, a, it's an issue across the county, not just Deerfield. And that kind of rolls into the next item I have here, which is our tenant protection for rent increases. Uh, they kind of work hand in hand. So we want to make sure we address this at some point so that we don't have a new problem with homelessness with the increased rates of rents and affordable housing prices. Next slide. Twenty years ago, it was we give people up to ten thousand dollars in order to purchase a home. That doesn't do anything now. These homes mm -hmm. are three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars. Is there any way to, mm -hmm. to look at increasing that allocation? Yep, that's yes. a that's a great question. Um, currently, the allocation is fifty thousand. Okay. Um, recommendations from actually the granting agency have been made to increase that to seventy thousand. Is something we plan on bringing forward to the city commission. Thank you. So now we look at our operating budget, and we have our for community services. We have our three divisions: administration, health and social services and grants and housing. So next slide. Uh, under administration, we'll see that there's an increase in 29% uh, for personnel services. So the reason for that increase is we're requesting a business manager position. And the reason for that request is in my time in the department, I've, I've identified gaps in the level of service. And this position will bring stronger oversight and accountability to maintaining compliance. Uh, this department, we're highly regulated. We're regulated through HUD, Broward County, the state, the area on agency. So it's important that we add this position so that we can maintain in compliance with the level of grants that we're working with. So uh, also under operating expenses, you'll see an increase there as well. So there's a transfer of lobbyist services and this was once housed under non-departmental and now be housed under the community services department, which is just fitting because we oversee all legislative affairs for the city. So it only makes sense that that budget is housed in our department. And then there's an increase, as I mentioned previously, our volunteer program is growing. Over the years uh, with COVID, we had to eliminate a lot of the programming. So we're looking to you know, run things fully operational. So we're requesting 6,000 there, and a portion of that is for our volunteer appreciation luncheon and to purchase swag. We wanna make sure that we give our volunteers something as a appreciation token for their service and their hard work and dedication. Next slide. So now we look at the health and social services division. And here we have two recreation coordinator positions that we're transferring from parks into community services. So currently those positions are housed in parks. However, they come over to the center on a daily basis to help with programming. So it just only makes sense to have those positions in the department, which would allow for better communication and productivity as well. And this is just a general fund to general fund transfer of the position from existing positions moving from one department within the general fund to another department within the general fund. Next slide. So now we look at our grants and housing division. So what we're looking to do here is we're merging our grants division with our housing division. And with that uh, merge, we'll transfer one existing position so they'll be all housed under one division. So essentially what we have is our housing division deals with grants. 
our grants division deal with grants. <laughs> so they're both dealing with grants. So it just makes sense to combine the two divisions and we call them the housing and grants division. So one division deals with competitive grants, the other one deals with entitlement grants. So it just makes sense to merge it as one. So this is a recommendation that we're making. Um, next slide. So under our CDBG, you'll see some decreases here. As I mentioned, there's a decrease in our funding allocation for fiscal year 23. Next slide. So with our home funds here, uh, we haven't received our actual allocation for fiscal year 23. This is based on previous years, which our numbers typically they're very similar. So we just posed the numbers from last year. Next slide. Or actually provided an increase based off of what our anticipated increase is going to be. Yes. So our next slide is our miscellaneous grants which we mentioned this, uh, this encompasses Shot Spotter, which is a federal appropriation of earmark. And we're looking at about 595,000 for the Shot Spotter technology, which will help BSO with detecting any shots that are fired within the city limits. And then we have our JAG grant, which is 27,000 as well, which is through the US Department of Justice. And this grant is for BSO to implement public safety strategies. So that encompasses our other miscellaneous grants. Next slide. So uh, under public works, we have more miscellaneous grants, miscellaneous grants, and we have our HMGP, our hazard, mit hazard mitigation grant program, which is 120,000. And this is for a generator for a lift station that we have near the middle school. Next slide. So now we go into our disaster recovery grants. So we have our hurricane loss mitigation grant, which we apply each year for HMMP. Uh, it's an allocation of 194,000. And with this grant, um, there's no $50,000 cap. This is only 25,000. It's for hurricane hardening. So it's for new roof, windows, and doors. That's all we can do under this program. And then we have CDBG CV, which this is round four of CDBG CV funds. So this, this round of funds did not come in a form of an entitlement. It was competitive. So we applied for the grant, we were successful. And we're gonna roll out three programs with these funds. We're gonna uh, supplement economic development with their ready to work credentialing program. We're gonna roll out senior technology programs, which I mentioned, we have our tablets. We wanna train them on iPhones, Androids and things like that. As well as we're gonna do a hot, a hot food program at the senior center where they'll be able to come in and get a hot meal. So we're gonna work with local restaurants in the community to provide meals on a weekly basis through this program as well. Nice grab on that grant, good job. What does the CV stand for? Coronavirus. Yes. <laughs> I knew where you're going. I knew where you're going. Bernie's not here. We're picking on him. I guess. Right. I guess that's where I was going. I just wanted to know where this plan wants to go. So, so now we move into our ship grant. We haven't received our allocation as well for this particular grant. So these are estimates based on previous awards. Our award is still pending. Next slide. So now we move into our community participation budget. So community participation program, this program again is in the form of a grant and it was designed to provide financial resources to local nonprofits and organizations to assist in serving the public in the city. So here we'll see that we had an increase in applications. In fiscal year 22, we had 10 applications. In fiscal year 23, we received a total of 14. Uh, what we provided was $125,000 in funding in fiscal year 22. Our request for 23 is 181,000. So uh, that's our community participation budget. And if, I, I'd like to pause there for a minute. You know, the community participation grant program, um, it's, always, uh, it's always a challenge. Uh, we, we, and as you, you can see, and as Jonathan has said, the requests of, of folks uh, requesting money from us, it, it, it continues to grow. And I think it's just a matter of as you, as word gets out, more and more people are, are coming to the well. Um, additionally, we you know, suspect that with what we've seen over the past few years with, with COVID and, and people knowing that there are 
funding coming to government, they they are coming to cities like us to request that they get a get a piece of that pie. I mean, I've been asked outright. You know, we understand that the cities are. You know, your your city got a lot of funding. We're wondering if you can help us out with X, Y, and Z. You know, so it it's it's this is not an easy uh, situation. I think the way in which we've had. Uh, or the policy decision made by the city commission, I should say, in order to place uh, this responsibility with staff in order to make the determination of who gets funding and at what level of funding. Um, I support that, obviously. I support that decision by the city commission. I think if it was being made by anybody else, it'd just be as difficult, if not more difficult. But I think the important thing for myself and for staff is to get some feedback from the city commission in terms of the direction that they'd like uh, the city staff and myself to go in when we're making these decisions so that we have an understanding of what the philosophies and, and are, are of the city commission as it is right now you know and it may be a method of just giving us direction maybe um, maybe something having to do with looking at the policy because right now the policy simply says um, if you're contributing to the city of deerfield beach and and its residents and businesses uh, and you're a nonprofit organization then basically you're eligible that's that's the short story i'm sure there's a legal description associated with that but i'm just giving you the the, the layman's version of it so again want to just provide that narrative for you know any potential direction conversation that that the commission wants to have with myself or staff because we will be the ones who to evaluate these proposals moving forward I think the best thing to do is keep it Deerfield Beach centric and show us what the return on investment is. What is our ROI? I don't want this, look, anybody's gonna come forward and say, hey, I want, I want, I need some money. That's smart, that's what they should do. Go to every city and do it. Doesn't mean we have to give it to them. What's our return on investment? What am I getting for what I'm giving you? If they can't prove it, cut them out. Or if it's small and it doesn't matter up, show us which ones had the best return on investment. But they need to be Deerfield Beach centric also. I don't want to be throwing a ton of money towards something that's a general Broward County service and we're not getting that back in Deerfield Beach. So that that's my, would be my direction. Thank you. I concur, but since you brought it up, you must have been thinking potentially of some tweaks to the program. Did you have anything specific in in mind? I mean, before the commission was making this these these calls and we would get mired for an hour on five thousand or two thousand here or there during the budget presentations it was just it was becoming way too much of a time constraint on on us for such a small component of a 200 million dollar budget and that's why i think we correctly you know ask staff to do that vetting for us to take some of the politics out of out of that and make it more of a um analysis of the return of investment as the mayor was saying that we're getting you know the bank for our for our buck but if you have some suggestions to tweak to tweak it i wouldn't i would not eliminate if you know at first when i was first elected i wasn't so sure that the city should be going down this road i've, I've come around and changed my mind is that yeah i think we need to be helping our community partners um you know but they need to have some you know some skin in the game too so so to speak this shouldn't just be a free a free handout but if there's something that you had in mind is, is to tweaking it i don't know I, I don't know how to tweak it um other than to just leave the parameters alone that we have now is that you have to be a specific deerfield related um interest in order to get the money there's some that i can just eyeball right now that i don't know what the specific connection to deerfield would be so um, unless you have some specific recommendations, how to tweak it. So far, I, I, from the feedback that I've received so far, I see that it's, it's really about making sure that what I, I got it return on investment and centric to Deerfield beach. Not that it's just regional service that we get, a, you know, we get a couple bites of the apple from, from this particular nonprofit, but that they're really focused in on the city of Deerfield beach. Uh, with that, I think I have enough to have conversations with with uh, Mr. Salas and the city attorney's office to ensure that the, the current policy holds to that and that um, the decisions being made and the recommendations being made by staff are are consistent with that. Cool. But 
that that would conclude this evening's uh, budget presentations, except for public comment. Okay. If there are no other questions. Is there anyone for the public care to comment? And I'd ask that Ms. Uh, Gilliard uh, direct us in that regard as she has, uh, she's got the computer with Zoom. Okay, Ms. Freitag, go right ahead. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, good evening, mayor. Good evening, staff. Um, I do apologize for my lateness on coming to the meeting. Um, I did get to catch a couple of the different presentations. One presentation in particular that I did not get a chance to catch was the information, um, the IT presentation. What I didn't get to find out is um, there is a situation going on at City Hall um, that is a borderline between IT and facilities. There is a piece of equipment that needs to be replaced and it's a matter of trying to figure out the fine line between IT and facilities and that fine line is whose budget does it fall in. There's, this is just one example of things across the board at the city that need to be addressed on different levels. Um, for This is one that to me is very imperative that the city addresses there's equipment in the city hall that has not been maintained has not been properly taken care of in over 10 years and at this point has become a very very severe fire hazard that absolutely needs to be addressed we just determined on saturday that this particular piece of equipment runs the entire server center the server room at city hall uh, if this equipment, when this equipment goes down due to the fires that could possibly be uh, the, the potential fire from the batteries. These are very strong batteries that are in that are starting to go into thermal runaway that are cr creating a very severe fire hazard that needs to be addressed immediately. Um, this is again is something that just came to our attention on Saturday just was determined as to what the consequences of this equipment is, um, how it pertains to the different departments within City Hall, it definitely needs to be addressed. And I know it is not on anybody's budget. There is, again, to me, it's a fine line of facilities and IT. It's the same thing that we go through with Parks and Rec, which we'll deal with tomorrow night between Parks and Rec and facilities. Who's build, whose job is it to maintain the buildings at Parks and Rec? But that, again, that's tomorrow night's discussion. But again, tonight's discussion between IT and facilities, somebody's gonna have to pony up and get this equipment replaced sooner rather than later, or the city hall will continue to have, uh, or, or basically just shut the equipment down for safety's sake, shut the equipment down and just run without any um, backup at City Hall would be the only other option at this time. So I'm hoping that uh, it's something that can get addressed quickly. Again, it's not on anybody's budget because it is last minute, but it is something that does need to be addressed. So I just wanna bring that to your attention and thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Clark Reed. Uh, good evening, Mayor, City Commissioners, staff. Um, I just want to say that um, it's been a very lively workshop and a lot of discussion about things that should have been discussed prior to the workshop. Um, I just want to know from um, the department that's um, the alert, the Deerfield Beach alert. Um, if one needs to change a phone number, because I get those alerts on my landline, but I'm basically on my cell phone. How do I get that changed, uh, you know, made that those alerts come to my cell phone? If someone could get that information to me, I would be very happy. Um, also, when you were talking about, I hear we're talking about the Dixie Highway corridor again, uh, continuously, but no one wants to sit down with the community and really make a plan 
for Dixie Highway. A lot, I'm very happy to hear that you have some history because that history would tell you that there were businesses on Dixie Highway and there was no need for us to look at times that going across the track, as one might say, to do anything because we had our own economic engines on Dixie Highway. When FDOT came through there, that has what destroyed Dixie Highway. So um, we need to really sit down and understand. And as uh, Commissioner Preston has said, yes, you're gonna have to offer incentives for businesses to come along Dixie Highway. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you for to adjourn the meeting. Motion? Motion to adjourn. All right, everyone in favor? All right, thank you. Staff can't count. All right. Oh, no, no, wait, 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 wait. Oh. Well, not yet. I didn't bang the gavel. Go ahead. Uh, you know, you talked about, uh, you know, how bad things like this or as a, you know, we might be. That's a pretty broad question, Commissioner. I'm not really sure in relation to what you what you mean. Uh, I, I if if I if I understand correctly, I would say the collective bargaining agreements. If I understand what you're saying, they're protected by by their by their. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and I would I would just say that I think we have we have pretty healthy reserves right now for for recessionary periods. Okay. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.